Good evening, all uh, our attendees, um, Capitola staff, and council members, and um, and guests. Um, welcome to this um, meeting of the uh, Capitola City Council for June 9, 2022. Um, and um, I'm going to begin by asking our city clerk to um, make an announcement. Thank you, Mayor Story. Welcome to the meeting. As you said, in accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to join, watch, and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our website or on our YouTube channel. As always, this meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician this evening is Walter. Thank you so much, Walter, and thank you, Mayor Story. Thank you, and thank you, Walter, for being our technician this evening. Um, this time, um, I would like to ask uh, Council Member Brown if she would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd be happy to. I pledge allegiance to the flag mm -hmm. of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, um, I'll now ask him if there are any additions or deletions to the agenda tonight. Does staff have any additions or deletions? Staff has no uh, proposed changes to the agenda. So the, um, the agenda will stand um, as printed. Um, and now um, it's my pleasure to um, move on to presentation. Um, the first presentation will be the introduction of our newly appointed Chief of Central Fire District uh, Chief, uh, Jason Nee. Um, Jason has um, Chief Nee, I should um, say, um, has uh, just been appointed uh, as May 3rd um, as the chief of the Central Fire Protection District. Um, but you know, he's had a long history with the Fire Protection District. He's been with that district since 1999. Um, prior to that, he served uh, with the city of, of Watsonville as a firefighter. Um, and then um, he earned his uh, associate degree in fire protection technology from Cabrillo and his Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies from UC Santa Barbara. He's a certified, uh, state certified uh, fire officer and chief officer. Um, with the Central Fire District, um, he's served in uh, numerous roles. He's been a uh, paid call firefighter, he's a firefighter and paramedic, he's been a captain battalion chief and assistant fire chief. Um, and um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, fire chief me. Um, and uh, any, um, to close my part, I just want to uh, thank you and um, all uh, the firefighters of the, uh, the Central uh, Fire District for the work that you do, your dedication in, in um, saving lives uh, and saving property. Um, and um, I mean, uh, you are truly uh, our first responders, um, and we owe you and all the firefighters a great deal of gratitude. Um, so, um, did you want to? Um, I'm sure you wanted to say a few words, uh, Chief Me. Well, thank you, Mayor Story, and uh, good evening, Capitola City Council. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I don't particularly love public speaking, but yes, uh, Mayor Story, I, I do have a couple of things that I wanted to go over um, with regard to Central Fire and uh, in my position. 
So, uh, yes, you're right. May 3rd, I, I took the helm of Central Fire. I replaced uh, Fire Chief John Walbridge, who is a resident of Capitola, and um, he retired on May 2nd. So uh, we wish him a very happy and healthy retirement. Um, and I, I wanted to point out some things to the city council, in, in case you're not aware, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on um, with our district that you, you might not be aware of. But uh, February 4th of 2021, Central Fire and the Aptopolis Selva Fire Protection District merged to create one larger agency. So instead of four stations that Central had and three stations that Aptos had, we're now a seven station organization. Um, and so we've been working through the growing pains um, that come with the consolidation. And uh, quite frankly, it's been going a lot better than we ever anticipated. Um, so if you see people and equipment in your neighborhood that you've never seen before, it's probably a result of the merger. So, and, and we're really fortunate to have great folks that have helped make that work. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out to the council was we are working, you know, it's fire season approaches. We are working diligently to work in our wildland urban interface. Doesn't necessarily directly impact the city of Capitola as much as some of our other um, part of the jurisdiction. But now we cover 90,000 people in 55 square miles. And so we've got, uh, we're pretty spread out among those seven uh, stations. And uh, so we're working hard on the wildland urban interface and we're getting ready for fire season. We're gearing up for that pretty, uh, pretty significantly now. We're expecting um, a significant fire season again this year. So unfortunately, California is gonna continue to burn and we're using a bunch of resources to get our folks prepared for that. We're expecting them to be out much of the season like they were for the last couple of years. And then uh, the last thing that I wanted to bring up was as a result of the merger, we're looking forward to developing a plan. So we had a pretty good idea of what we were, four station department and three station department respectively, uh, but now we're, we're taking a deep dive into what we should be doing as a new seven station department. And part of that piece is looking to our external stakeholders, like the folks from the city of Capitola. And uh, we, we hired a, a consulting firm to help us with our master plan, strategic plan, and standards cover. <clears throat> the master plan looks at you know 10 to 20 years, strategic plan three to five years, and the standard of cover is like, where, where should we have our apparatus? Where should our stations be to get the best response? And as a result, we're gonna ask our um, external stakeholders to help us figure out what we do well, what we, what we could improve upon, and what are some uh, weaknesses and, and threats that, that we might see as an organization. So um, actually City Manager Goldstein is gonna come in for an in-person interview, but uh, for the city council members, uh, we'll be sending out an email in the next couple of weeks to invite you to participate in that survey it's, it's done online and essentially what they're looking for, like I said, they call it a SWOT analysis. What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are some opportunities that we might have and what are some threats that we might have? So um, expect that in your inbox in the next couple of weeks. And uh, that's all the comments that I have unless there's any questions. Thank you for letting me uh, join your meeting today. All right, thank you, Chief Lee. Uh, do council members um, have questions for the chief? Um, and, oh, um, yeah, uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. No question. Just wanted to congratulate you, Chief Me, and that's a great accomplishment. And happy to merge with Aptos and keep Central Fire going. And again, thank you all for all the hard work that you do. Thank you very much. It, you know, um, we are not far, our, our headquarters is not far. We're on 17th Avenue. Um, we correspond regularly with uh, the police department about matters um, and you know we're your local fire department so please f feel free at any time to either have uh, Jamie reach out to me or or any of the other staff we'll, we'll try to be as responsive as we can for for our local folks so thank you very much oh I see you yeah. down there sorry yeah. council member Bertrand oh, you you're on mute council member okay um Thank you very much. We get automatically turned to mute as soon as the, um, <laughs> the oath of office and all these other things start happening. Um, but anyway, um, so as a member of the public, not as a member of this um, board, 
um, I often wonder why do you know, paramedics show up from you know some private agency at a local issue, whatever it may be, and then the fire department also shows up. It, it, it seems kind of um, wasteful. I mean, why doesn't one show up? I mean, I know there's a logical reason, and I just like to know what it is. <laughs> why do both agencies show up and maybe just don't know who's going to show up first? I, I just really would like to understand that. That's all. Yeah, that that's a great question. We get it all the time. Um, oftentimes, you're right, it is overkill to have five five people, sometimes six people, and um, all the big heavy equipment driving down the street for uh, a multitude of things. But really what it comes down to is fire departments, fire districts like ours are strategically located to respond to um, essentially building fires, house fires, um, with expediency and to get as many folks on scene as possible as quickly as possible. On the private ambulance side of things um, and so and so as a matter of our locations and the way we're spread out and the way we cover each other when other folks are out um, we I would say we probably get to most incidences uh, before the ambulance ever gets there and uh, on every piece of apparatus every piece of equipment that we have we've got a paramedic on board and so we have advanced life support capabilities so we are the first generally in Central's district we're there I don't know what the number is, but I'm guessing it's probably 70% of the time, maybe 80% of the time we're there before the private ambulance company. Private ambulance company is um, more spread out throughout the county. Their staffing fluctuates. We have minimum staffing that we have to maintain for the, the fire protection piece. And so, um, and they move up and down between the two hospitals within the county. So it's for the public safety, we send both and um, in the event that there needs to be life-saving measures, they can be affected by the fire department resources that arrive on scene generally before uh, a private ambulance company shows up. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the public that's listening would be um, very happy with your response to this item. Any other questions uh, for the chief? Um, chief, um, I. Concerning your strategic planning, um, how will, will members of the public be able to participate in that process? Will there be outreach, and uh, and how will you be doing that so that uh, you know they could um, uh, give some input? Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor Story. It's uh, thank you for setting that up for me. Um, so <laughs> June 29th, we're going to hold a virtual um, community okay. meeting with our. Uh, with our contractor. We'll be releasing a press release. We'll be releasing um, social media releases um, to invite members of the public, like you mentioned, to participate in essentially the a little bit of educational piece about why we're doing it and, and what we are. And then uh, the night of the 29th, we'll make live a link on Central Fire's website that allows members to, to answer the, a lot of the same questions, maybe not so much um, based on um, what, a, what the community, what the organization of a community wants, like the a city council, but more like what does the community expect from their fire department and what was their interaction with the local fire district and et cetera. So that's a great question. Thank you for, the, for teeing that up for me. That's uh, June 29th, I think it's at 5 p.m. Um, and it, it'll be virtual meeting. Well, um, thank you for um, inviting us to participate in this previous planning process. Um, I think that's going to be uh, an important, um, you know, um, exercise and step for the, the now merged uh, fire uh, districts uh, to do. Um, and um, and I'll just, you know, we we um, you know, continue to look toward. Um, Strengthening our partnership, um, you know, in order to uh, preserve and you know increase uh, public safety. So, thank you for coming and being on this evening, um, and we look forward to um, further collaboration. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. So now I'm going to move on to um, the next. Um, 
uh, item on our presentations, and this is a proclamation recognized in June 2022 um, as Elder Abuse Awareness uh, Month. Um, and um, um, oh, there's the, and there's Gabriel. Uh, hi, Gabriel. Let me um, just um, maybe um, speak to the proclamation, um, um, and then I'll I'll turn it over to you. Um, but um, uh, one, you know, the the proclamation is to recognize that in the city of Capitola, there are um, 2,400 residents that are age 60 and over. Um, um, and, you know, if you think about it, that's about 25% of our total population. Um, and they are an important uh, part of our community. They enrich and strengthen our community uh, with all, you know, the ways that they uh, participate. Um, and they deserve to be um, treated with respect and dignity. However, you know, there are more than 1,600 reports of, of abuse against elders um, received every year by the St. Louis County Adult Protective Services. Um, it's reported that one out of 10 Americans age 60 and over experience adult abuse, um, and as few as one out of 24 um, uh, elder abuse cases are actually ever even reported um you know and as our population um, um lives longer um we are presented with an opportunity to think about our collective needs and future um and um, and recognizing that it is all up to us to ensure that proper social structures exist so people can retain community and societal connections uh, and reducing the likelihood of abuse. And I do want to um, acknowledge there are many uh, um, agencies in San Francisco County which have created a system of collaboration uh, to support um, seniors and to prevent child abuse. Um, there are the Human Services Department, uh, Adult and Long-Term Care Services Division, the San Francisco County Sheriff's Department, the Capitola Police Department, the District Attorney, the Seniors Council Area on Aging, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program, the Public Guardian, and, and, and many other community service partners um, who work to prevent abuse um, and protect victims. Um, and speaking of those agencies, I, I did want to um, kind of given an acknowledgement to our former district attorney, attorney Bob Lee, um, who established our first uh, elder care task force, um, you know, here in Santa Cruz County. Um, I was honored to be able to be invited to participate on that task force. Um, and I just want to, you know, really acknowledge um, Bob Lee's uh, compassion and diligent work in preventing uh, elder abuse uh, and bringing attention to that cause. Um, and um, also, um, to continue with the proclamation, I want to acknowledge that Santa Cruz County is a leader in the state of California in assisting our vulnerable elderly citizens through education, advocacy, and collaboration on abuse issues. Um, and therefore, I, Sam Story, Mayor of the City of Cox College, we have our recognized June 15, 2022, as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, uh, and to claim the month of June to be Elder Abuse Awareness Month, and encourage all citizens of the City of Cox College to join me in this observance. Um, so, um, um, thank you for that, and I'll turn it over to you, uh, Gabriel, if you wanted to. Um, and add a few words. Thank you, Mayor Strike, and thank you, members of the council. On behalf of Adult Protective Services team of Santa Cruz County, I'd like to thank the city of Capitola for this proclamation. So our, our team, the APS team in Santa Cruz County, investigates allegations of abuse, neglect, self-neglect, and other types of exploitation among the older and dependent adult population 
throughout our county. We try to reduce the risk and enhance the safety of all community dwelling older and dependent adults in Santa Cruz County. The issue of elder abuse is significant, not just in terms of the impact to the individual, but really in terms of the scale. And the issue is growing with our ever increasing aging population. The estimates are that by the, by the year 2050, between 20 and 25% of the population of the United States will be above the age of 65. As stated in the proclamation and according to National Council on Aging, roughly 10% of Americans over the age of 60 have experienced some form of elder. Now, there's not a lot of research because the area of aging is not as funded as like ch child protective services, but various studies estimate that issues with self-neglect adversely affect somewhere between 10 and 21% of American older adults. As you reflect on your own personal connections among your family, your neighborhood, church community, consider that upwards of one to two out of every 10 older adults in our circles may be suffering some form of abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation, or the inability to meet their own needs. It is imperative that we keep this in mind as the proclamation stated, you know, we estimate that only one in every 24 incidents of abuse is ever reported or brought to the attention of another person. This highlights the importance of events like this. Raising awareness on the issue of elder abuse will increase attention to the issue, ease fears in seeking help and support, and hopefully will create a community where we can all come together to work towards the elimination of abuse in our elder and vulnerable adult population. Um, I was wondering if I would be able, the Santa Cruz County Adult Protective Services, we've been doing a, a campaign to film and produce uh, short videos about elder abuse uh, and distribute them as public service announcements. We've managed to uh, have, you know, shoot our first video, which is about four minutes long um, and it highlights the experience of one of our, um, our survivors of abuse. Uh, so if I might be able to post the links in the chat, um, maybe you guys would want to take a look at it. Oh, yes, go ahead and post the link in the chat, uh, Gabriel. Um, and then, um, yes, uh, all of us can uh, take a look at it, um, you know, um, after the meeting. Okay. The chat is actually disabled. Uh, so, yeah, so my recommendation, Gabriel, will be forwarded to our city clerk, and she can pass on that information to our council members. Excellent. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. Uh, are, there, uh, are there any questions from council members um, for Gabriel? And, um, oh, uh, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, my question has to do with the funding. So do you feel that the department that's currently funded is, is adequately uh, resourced? And as the, uh, you know, I see that smile. And so my lead <laughs> is, yes, it is. And, um, so I don't know how much you could talk about, but you you know, as part of the proclamation, and you've alluded to, there, there's so many more people that are becoming to be in this demographic. So it seems that that plan of for funding has to be increased over, you know, each funding cycle because the load on the department is going to be greater. So that that's sort of my second question, my main focus actually. Are you responding to? the number of increased elderly and the incidences so that you could adequately address them. Thank you. Sure, thank you, that's a good question. Um, as in any social service, there is never enough funding to do everything that we want to do. Um, the good news is that uh, people are taking notice up in Sacramento and uh, I've been with 
service is going on nine years now. Uh, when I started, we had uh, three social workers and a public health nurse and a supervisor. That was our team. Uh, currently, we have nine social workers, uh, two public health nurses, and two supervisors. Uh, so we have expanded quite a bit. Uh, recently, uh, California changed the standard or the age standard for what describes an elder, uh, and they lowered the age from 65 to 60, uh, which is more in line with the federal statutes. And along with the changes uh, has come some funding. And so, uh, you know, the, for the first time in, like I said, the nine years that I've been here, uh, there is money attached to the increasing needs and increasing levels of response that we want to do. And so currently um, the department is actually adding about two or three more social workers, the field workers and investigators, uh, so that we can more adequately respond to, you know, the needs of our community. Thank you very much. That's good news to hear. Seeing no other questions from council members, I just, um, Gabriel, I want to thank you for the work that you do uh, to protect the elders. Um, it is, it is, I know it's very difficult and it's but very important work. Um, so thank you um, and um, for all the staff at Adult Protective Services. Um, and, um, um, and, and thank you for being here this evening. And I hope this helps bring more awareness to, you know, the community um, in, um, you know, with June being Elder Abuse Month. So, thank you. Oh, Council Member Bertrand, did you have your hand up again? Yeah, I, I, I do have a comment to make, if I may, Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Not a question. So, I've been involved with the uh, Senior Council for a while, and now because I'm on the City Council, I'm on the advisory group. And I might add that uh, Sam is the alternate, so he's involved there too. Um, one thing I've become aware of, and this is maybe golly, 15 years or more that a kind of association, is um, it, it, it's sort of the way society looks at elderly people in, in a way that they're disregarded. I mean, they're, the abuse that I've seen and the stories that I've heard and the things that I've witnessed personally are basically because this segment of our population is almost forgotten. It's like, it's a very sad thing. And I could go on that way, but I don't want to. But I think that's part of the problem with abuse. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you for, for that comment, yes. Yeah, really. One of the biggest factors that, that facilitates abuse is the feeling of isolation and helplessness. I mean, in, whether it's an external abuse, abuse from a family member or another person, uh, the, the isolation, the, the embarrassment, the shame that people feel uh, keeps them from, you know, and, and the fear of losing their independence, uh, you know, keeps people from reporting problems. Uh, but Adult Protective Services is here to help to problem solve and our goal is to keep people safe and as independent as possible in the community. Uh, we, we don't go into people's homes and take them out of their homes. Um, you know, sometimes even if we want to, because we see the situation as, as dangerous, uh, but our goal is to problem solve around specific issues that facilitate abuse. And so, you know, definitely thank you guys for having me. Uh, please, you know, um, don't hesitate to call us if you have any questions or concerns uh, and, and spread it out to the community. Again, well, thank you. And just one closing question, Gagro. If uh, members of the public wanted to uh, contact Adult Protective Services, um, I did to get information uh, to report suspected abuse. Uh, what number would they call? Yes. So we have uh, a toll free number which is 
1-866-580-4357. And that acronym spells out HELP. So 1-866-580-HELP. Well, thank you. And thank you for being here this evening uh, to share that information. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good night. Good night. The next presentation is a report on tobacco grant and outreach at New Brighton um, Middle School. And, and um... Good evening, Council. I'm uh, Brantley Sandretti. I'm a sergeant with Capsule PD. Did want to just take a moment to give you all an update on that tobacco grant. As you're aware of, we were awarded that grant this past year in effect for the next two years. As uh, part of that grant was some outreach and education. Um, once becoming aware of the grant, at the time, Mayor Brooks presented a vision of having the youth teaching youth model up at New Brighton Middle School. So from there, this last fall, I ended up meeting with six eighth grade students and teaching them over the course of several months about tobacco use, its negative effects on the environment as well as the human body. Um, once they were prepared, they presented to several sixth grade classes, which encompassed about 200 students at that New Brighton Middle School. After that presentation, I had reached out to the 2Pay program here in Santa Cruz County, which is a tobacco use prevention and education program. At that point, several adult advocates actually came out and they conducted several uh, additional follow-up presentations to these sixth grade students just to really drive the point home on all the negative effects that tobacco has, how big tobacco is targeting youth, all the chemicals in these products, and just all the harm that it's doing to the environment. From there, I followed up with the youth presenters as well as teachers, the principal. The overall consensus was that the program was successful. The kids actually had, they were very responsive to it. <clears throat> they said they actually enjoyed doing the presentations, which I know when I was in the eighth grade, that would probably be like one of the last things. No one really liked public speaking. So for these kids to stand up, show that leadership at a young age um, was really impressive to me. I enjoyed working with them. And at this point, moving forward, we're just looking at different avenues to implement the program in years moving forward. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sergeant Sandretti, uh, for that uh, uh, update and presentation. Uh, do council members have questions? Yes, council member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Sergeant Sandretti, you know, um, not often do many police officers enter this line of work thinking that they would be working one on one in a middle school um, implementing tobacco prevention. And I am just so uh, proud of Capitola Police and ENU and and Sergeant Ryan for really taking this on and challenging yourselves and reaching out to our youth in our community. Um, you know, just a couple of years ago for, for our community to, to remember is that we, um, we prohibited the sales of flavored tobacco here in the city of Capitola, really following um, it, the model of what other cities were, were trying to implement. And because of that, we're, we're here today um, seeing the, the work, the good work continue. And so um, I know this is above and beyond your regular role. Um, and I just want you to know that I'm really, really grateful for you and your time and your commitment to the students. Um, so thank you so much and great job. I got to see the, you know, your work in, in action and, um, and your presence is so important and is respected more so now than before because of what you're doing. So thanks again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, and um, yeah, and thank you for giving us an update uh, on that uh, grant program and all the work uh, you're doing to uh, really educate um, and help our children um, avoid uh, really an, uh, an intractable and uh, dangerous habit um, that they may, um, you know, um, otherwise uh, engage in. So um, thank you for that. Um, and all your service to the uh, city of Capitola. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, you see, now that will bring us to additional materials. Are there additional materials uh, for tonight's meeting? Mayor Story.
sorry, none were received. Okay. Uh, now we'll move on to oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public uh, to address the council on matters that are not on tonight's agenda or that are on the consent agenda for this evening. Uh, if you would like to speak in public comment, raise your uh, hand in the Zoom application, um, or you can dial star nine, um, and our moderator will uh, give you up to three minutes to speak. Um, also, you can send an email to public comment at um, ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, Larry, is there, um, I don't see any hands up, um, but is there, are there any emails that may have come in? Mayor Story, we have not received any emails on this topic, and you're right, we do not, I do not see any hands raised on it. Okay, I'm going to um, uh, now move on to uh, staff. Uh, and public comments. Are there any staff, uh, strike that staff and city council comments? Are there any staff comments? City clerk has an announcement for us this evening, I believe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, city manager and mayor and council. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to remind council and anyone who may be uh, watching and listening to the meeting there is a candidate information night coming up on June 20th at 6 p.m. This is for anyone interested in running for Capitola City Council because as you know, our election is coming up in November and there are three seats up for election. So anyone who's interested, this is a great opportunity to learn how you run for local office because it's not something everyone knows. So please feel free to attend. It is a virtual workshop. Uh, again, 6 p.m. Monday, June 20th, and the Zoom information is included on our website or call City Hall. I can talk you through it. Uh, even if you just have an inkling, this is a very low um, risk opportunity to learn about, about running for office. And it will be mostly led by our county clerk, but I will also be attending and available to answer questions. So I just wanted to uh, say that publicly here, and we will be promoting this opportunity on social media, so please spread the word. Okay? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you um, for that important announcement. Uh, there are other council members that um, have uh, announcements. Yes, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I, we just had a meeting today, with, or I just had a meeting today with the Youth Action Network, one of our partners here with the City of Capitola, and they are working with Capitola Foundation, um, a donation to them on creating a punch card for students or for, for kids in the community that are doing good things. Um, it's kind of a positive reinforcement or a reward system to engage youth um, and to encourage them to do, to do good things. So I just wanted to mention that um, um, because the, the Police department is also supporting that venture, and so they're just hats off to them for really just investing their time and commitment to the youth in our community. And so um, you should see more about that soon. Um, and hopefully, all of us will have punch cards in our pockets to hand out to kids throughout the community that you see doing good things. So um, more to come on that. Thank you. Council Member Brooks, if I if a kid should fill the punch card, what did they get for it? Uh, I wish I could give them a million dollars, right? Um, but, uh, right, yeah. but right now, um, Sergeant Ryan and, and the Youth Action Network director are looking for um, businesses to donate. And so a good example is, and I'm putting them all on blast, so no one has committed, but like, for example, Zelda could give like a free soda to a student on the punch card or Miho's Tuckeria could give a free bag of chips or a sticker from the surf shop um, as a reward system. The, the cool thing is what I'm hoping that the outcome is, is that the Youth Action Network then collects the student information and then connects them to additional resources available to the community. And um, one of those resources is like what um, 
council member brown brought is like our student commission and so like getting them connected to something like that getting them to attend a council meeting and so forth so um yes that's that's the the the, the gist of it well that, that sounds like a great program i'm always um supportive of, 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 of positive reinforcement so yeah and hats off to captain ryan for 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 really supporting that Yes, well, yeah, thank you, Captain Ryan. Um, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I just wanted to share for those who weren't aware that this weekend is the Capitola Custom Rod and Classic Car Show in the Village uh, put on by our Public Safety and Community Service Foundation. Uh, it's going to start on Saturday with the cars cruising from the boardwalk into the village around 830. It'll end at 5. Um, I'm really excited to see it. It's always a fun event every year. And so I would encourage uh, anyone who is interested in, in seeing these cars and being part of the excitement uh, here in the village to go check it out. All right, thank you. Um, and let's see, uh, Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, I just want to thank Capitola's staff for putting out such a great calendar for them. I uh, received it in the mail recently. Um, it was well done, very colorful, uh, easy to read, and I couldn't think of anything that was missed. Um, I could just see how many people now are realizing how many things Capitola provides in um, terms of recreation and special events uh, for its citizens and visitors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and. And just to uh, reinforce that and uh, remind everyone that the um, first Twilight concert is actually next uh, Wednesday, June the 15th, starting at 6 p.m. Um, on the Esplanade. Uh, so come um, and have a good time. Um, so looks like we have no other council comments. So uh, we'll now move to the consent um, agenda. Uh, portion of the meeting this evening. Uh, this list of items will be approved um, or denied. I guess that's a possibility with a single vote. Um, and um, so I'll see if um, um, one, if um, any council member would like to pull one of the consent items uh, and move it to uh, our general government portion of the meeting. I'll move the consent agenda. Okay, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda as it is. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, can we have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. And I, the consent calendar passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item eight, which is the general government of the hearings for this evening. Our first item A is the pavement management plan update and five-year road repair plan. The recommended action is to approve the proposed five-year street improvement schedule list and direct staff to prepare a resolution for adoption at the June 23rd City Council meeting approving the list of streets receiving 2022-23 road repair and rehabilitation uh, funds. Um, so um, take it away, Steve. Thank you, Mayor. Council, good to be with you tonight. Uh, as the agenda item says, tonight's item is a update on our state of the streets and other current for the pavement uh, management report. This year we have a new report, it was last done in 2017. So this is a little bit overdue, we're trying to do it every four years or five years out this time. Um, I'll say in advance, I apologize, it's gonna be a rather lengthy report. We will try and go as fast as we can, but there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, so with that, I will introduce Joe Ryrie. Joe is a senior principal and engineer with Pavement Engineering Incorporated. Pavement Engineering Incorporated is a firm, civil engineering firm that only does pavement management work. It's their specialty. When we've done these before, we've had 
civil, civil firms that have done a variety of civil work, but pavement engineering is the, uh, from, from what I can see, is an expert in the field, and Joe is certainly well versed. So with that, I will hand it off to Joe, and then I will be coming back to discuss the five-year list of schedules with another presentation. So Joe, it's all yours. Uh-oh, we're not hearing you. Yeah. No? You seem to be on mute, um, Mr. Reary. You're muted. Yeah, oh, there we go. But we still can't hear you. We can't, we're not uh -oh. getting audio. Thank you, microphone. Still nothing. Mr. Reary, it may, I, I see you have light uh, ear pods in. Maybe that's the mic and the computer isn't working. I'm just curious if I'm thinking play. No, no, no audio. Mm. <clears throat> well, well, what, what, maybe, maybe, Steve, what? Let, um, Mr. Reary, what? See if you can um, maybe work on your system. Um, I'm, in, I'm going to go back to Steve, and, and maybe we should um, try to improvise here. Um, I, I don't know, Steve. I'll um, see if you want to go through your list, um, your portion of it, the first. And then maybe we can come back to Mr. Reary, or um, if you want to um, kind of fill in for him. Um, yeah, I, I'll start his report. And Joe, if you get connected and microphone working, just speak up and uh, I'll quickly hand it off to you. But I, I think it's best that we, we get going. So, right. And you, um, give me a minute. I don't have his presentation yeah. quite up yet. Yeah, I heard him. I think we heard him. Yeah. Oh, can you, try again, Mr. Reary. Can, can you hear us, Mr. Reary? Oh, is he frozen now? I I'm swear, not, we heard him for a second. Oh, it yeah. was working. Yeah. Can you hear us, Mr. Reary? I heard him briefly. He did something right. All right. Well, I'm going to go find this presentation and we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, just just jump in when. Oh, wait a minute! I see connecting to audio, but still not working. Steve, why don't you go ahead? All right. Um, Give me a minute here. Maybe Larry could phone him and give him some help. Says he's connected, but there's there's nothing coming through. Is one of his top keys pushed? No, it's function keys on the top. Okay, I'll, well, I'm ready to share my screen, and <clears throat> you get any Joe? I barely hear you. Oh, okay. The volume control, maybe. I apologize, counsel. You know, that's the nature of this technology, please. Uh, what? I don't know. If you're, if you're ready to go ahead, Steve, why don't you go ahead and do that, and we'll let Mr. Reary uh, jump in uh, when he can. Um, okay, can you see this slide now? Yep. Okay. Thank good. you. Yeah, the side's coming up. All right. So this is an update of the 2000. I just uh, heard him talk. 
you can talk loud enough to overcome me, I'll, I'll gladly pass this off. Um, oh, I heard him laugh now. Okay. <laughs> there is an audio control next to your mute. So if you push mute button. Let's 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 Larry, Larry work on it with him and we'll go yeah, okay. for it. So this is a complete update on what pavement management is and um, what our current situation is in Capitola. So I'm um, going to give you a quick pavement 101 just so you understand it. The pavement section is, as we know, a sub-base of base rock and drainage material over an asphalt pavement structure. Um, pavement deteriorates with time. Um, a new road will have a 100 rating, and as it ages, it deteriorates, it begins to deteriorate faster as it gets older until it gets to the point where it's basically completely deteriorated and you're rebuilding it. Deterioration occurs from <clears> the <throat> oxidizing effects of sun and water and fatigue from heavy wheel loads. And what that means is as the heavy vehicles drive over the asphalt, they crack it apart, and that allows water to seep in and destabilize the ground base here, the um, asphalt base, which then leads to further cracking and more leaking. So it's kind of a degenerative cycle as time goes on. Really the heavy loads, um, these are different size vehicles. And this is in comparison to what a typical passenger SUV would, would mean. So a three, -wheel, three axle truck is 1,500 um, standard SUVs driving, one, one pass from that. The biggest one here I want to point out is garbage trucks. So every street has garbage trucks on it, residential. Uh, they're all there, collectors, arterials. So one garbage truck passing by on a road is equal to over 9,000 passenger vehicles traveling on it. And that's probably the biggest deterioration factor um, on local roads, especially the residential roads, because you usually design them uh, not like a 41st Avenue isn't designed the same way a street in Riverview Heights or Riverview neighborhood, just because of that. But you end up having to build up a big enough section over time to deal with the garbage load. Steve, am I coming through now? I hear you. Yes, loud and clear. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. You want to take it from here? I would love to. You I think that's all on the slide, so we don't have to go through that. Okay. Are we just going to use your slides then? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the David and thank you, City Council. I, I, Mayor and City Council, I apologize. Um, um, technical expertise. Uh, I'm much more of an expert on pavement than I am on on Zoom meetings. And so um, with that. Uh, this pavement engineering was was asked by the city to go out and, and update their pavement your pavement management system, um, and we we use Street Saver. It's a it's a budgeting tool, an inventory tool, a record of, of pavement conditions, and it helps guide us in terms of what what streets we want to be able to select. Um, next slide, Steve. Um, so there's different types of, uh, we, we evaluate the pavements using a, a pavement condition index. We call it a PCI, and it's basically a report card for your pavement. It's a scale from 100 to zero. Um, it was developed in World War II by the Army Corps of Engineers to rate airports. And, um, and you're able to then be able to compare your pavements uh, to other cities and other agencies, as well as among yourselves, to see how effective you're being. Next slide, Steve. So when we go out and we look at distresses, we're looking at various types of distresses, and these are just some common distresses that are associated with, with asphalt pavement. Um, there's weathering and rattling and, and uh, transverse and block shrinkage cracking. Um, as well as the one on the right is alligator cracking. Looks like alligator skin. I want to point out that the first three types of, of slides are all associated with environmental type distresses, uh, which means you can build a pavement and never see a heavy and never it would never see a heavy vehicle and it would still deteriorate. 
alligator cracking, when you see that, it's a, it's a symptom of pavement uh, fatigue uh, cracking, and so it's being overloaded. Thanks to the next one. So we went out and we looked at a number of different types of distresses in order to be able to come up with the PCI. So let's give you some examples of what a, a PCI might look like. Next slide. So here's a couple of examples. So the picture on the left is a PCI of 100, which means it has no distresses in it at all. It's brand new pavement. And the, the um, photo on the right represents a PCI of, of 28. Um, and you can see that there's alligator cracking on it, and you can also see the other types of, of distresses, block cracking. And, and then if we go to the next slide, this reminds us why we have pavements in the first place. And so our next slide. So let's go over some pavement management principles um, just to help guide us in understanding how to manage your pavements. Um, quite simply, it's just applying the right treatment to the right pavement at the right time using the right materials. Let me show you uh, graphically what that means. So Steve pointed out to you, and by the way, great job, Steve, on, on coming for you. Next time I have audio problems, I'm reaching out to you to cover in for me on, on city council meetings. Um, but the gold line represents a pavement deterioration curve, and it doesn't deteriorate linearly. It kind of looks good for a while and then falls off. And there's, there's um, different points along this curve when you want to apply certain types of treatments. When it's in, and, and when you're looking at pavements, um, there's basically three different types of strategies that you want to apply when when managing your pavements. And, and in all the years that I've done this, these are the only three that I've come up with. And the first one is just focusing, if you've got limited dollars, you focus your, pave, your dollars on the pavements that are in good condition and you try and keep them in good condition. The other approach is, is you take your limited dollars and you focus it on the worst pavements in town. The, the best first and worst first, while they're strategies, they're not long-term or sustainable strategies. If you keep focusing on your best first strategies, you'll end up with a group of pavements that are in good condition and, a, and another group of pavements that are in poor condition. And if you're gonna always work on your worst first pavements, what you end up with is pavements that are, are um, you end up spending your highest dollars on those pavements. And so the strategy that we like to try and help our clients use is what we call a critical point management style. And graphically what that looks like is that you have your deterioration curve and what you're trying to do is, is catch the pavements and then and treat the pavements before they fall into the next category or needing the next type of treatment. And so that would be each place where there's one of those red circles indicating where you're, you're optimizing the pavements. Interesting, when you do that, you're trying to actually save money. And so on the next slide, it shows that, that if you're focusing on pavements in the upper range, you're spending money that's anywhere, you know, 50 cents to 60, 70 cents a square foot. And you can see the ranges are dropping all the way down into your reconstruct areas where you're spending as much as 20 or $22 a square foot. And so you're trying to catch those pavements before they drop further and further down and cost more and more money. And um, there's different types of treatments that you apply. Well, we call it a light maintenance or a heavy maintenance or even a reconstruct or a, uh, or a heavy rehabilitation. That's a broad category, uh, and there are several treatments that you can apply depending on the needs of the treat of the pavement. Our next slide. So let's go over what we found for Capitola. So this is where it gets really fun for you. Um, the uh, I think we got to go back one slide, Steve. There we go. Okay. Um, the city. Um, manages and maintains 20, a little over 27 center line miles. That's the center of the street. Doesn't matter if there's two lanes or four lanes, it's just the very center of the street. 
uh, you have over 4 million square feet of paving, 400 and 690,000 actually. And your system-wide PCI average, if you average all of the streets together, all of the PCIs, is a 54. Your replacement value for your streets, and this is just the streets. It doesn't include curb and gutter. It doesn't include the sidewalks or the lights or anything else that goes with it. It's just the pavement alone. If you needed to reconstruct that, remove it all and reconstruct it, it would be over $96 million. So that's the size of the asset. I would, I would venture to say it's your largest asset that the city, that the city owns. Um, your uh, overall road maintained system, we kind of look at it in various ways. And so we're looking at it in, in this uh, table as a functional classification. So we categorize this different pavements depending on their their uh, category. So your arterials are your most used street. That's like 40, uh, 41st. Um, your residentials are the streets that you live on, the local streets. And your collectors are the in-between streets. And so you can see that your arterials, your most used streets, are actually in the best condition. They have an average PCI of 61. Your collectors are 52. And overall, your residentials average out to 49. Next slide. This slide is just trying to show groupings of, of pavements. So we take all your PCIs and we look at it in, in groups of, of 10 points. I call it the 10 point spread. And you can see that there's two areas that really stand out in your overall system. Um, yeah, exactly, Steve, you, you pointed them out perfectly. So, so the ones on the left are your you're um, telling you that those streets right there are more in your maintenance mode. And if we don't catch those using critical point management practices, they're going to fall over into the, to the right and keep moving further and further down and get more expensive. But we have a chance to catch those right now. And then the other three bar graphs that you see are more of the rehabilitation treatments that we need to be able to apply. Okay, so let's talk about some funding needs uh, for the city of Capitola and what we have found out. So we took all of the data and we ran various scenarios to be able to come up with uh, the system. And I want to point out that when we ran these scenarios, um, I told you that your average PCI was a, was a PCI of 54. But we factored into these scenarios all of the all of the projected treatments that are going to be happening in in this fiscal year. So these are projects that have already funded and are are set to be worked on, whether it be in conjunction with the county or um, or a city project. And so we're starting with a with a PCI of 57. In order to maintain your, P, your PCI of 57, the city would need to maintain, or to do that, you need to be able to spend an average of $2.1 million per year to keep your system in, at the same uh, level. If you wanted to raise it just five PCI points to a 62, you would need to invest $3.1 million and to get it up to a 70 which is kind of a coveted place to be because your system is in a more maintenance mode uh, you would need to spend 4.9 million dollars we ran um, the projected budget and so if you look at or for the five-year plan that steve's going to be talking to you about that's that dark purple line that that steve is tracing right there and that's averaging um, just under $1 million per year. Um, and I want to point out to you that it includes a grant for uh, the intersection of uh, 41st and Capitola um, in the first year. So that's a big chunk of money that's coming in. And then we're assuming that there's a grant in the, in the last year too uh, with this projection. And so you're seeing that with the existing funding that you have, and even with the grant money, which is almost a million dollars that we've assumed in grant money, your, your system is going to come out in five years to be a 54. 
What does that mean in deferred maintenance? We can see that in our next slide. Uh, right now, the city has $22 million in deferred maintenance for their pavement costs. And if uh, we are able to follow the five-year pavement plan, uh, we can expect that deferred maintenance to grow as high as $32 million. And so with that, uh, I wanted to put together some different recommendations for the, the city and staff to consider in managing your pavements. Um, first of all, you want to continue to update your pavement management system. It's a great tool to be able to communicate back and forth with everybody and understand um, how you're doing with your treatments. Uh, it's a, it's, um, it's a great accountability uh, system as well. Um, you want to develop a multi-year uh, pavement expenditure plan, which I'm, I'm excited that, that Steve has done that. Um, and you want to focus on two areas. You've got to have a maintenance component and a rehabilitation component to deal with those groups of, of pavements that we showed you on the 10-point spread graph. Um, uh, because you have limited funding, you want to continue to focus your limited funding to preserve your critical assets, and that is mainly your um, arterials. It's your most used streets. Um, along with the with the uh, most used streets comes grant uh, eligibility, and so you want to continue to leverage your your limited dollars using grants. Um, it's been great working with the city because you guys seem to be doing well with your grants. Um, but you want to continue to look for that to be able to spread that money around. And then um, I wanted to share with you that I have seen several agencies who are trying to figure out how to uh, infuse additional money um, because your, your, um, Limited money is not just, you're, you're not alone in what you're dealing with. You've got um, any, any city in California struggling uh, trying to get enough money. And so I would consider, I've seen cities consider using refuge uh, impact fees um, as well as utility impact fees. Uh, refuge impact fees would be associated with um, recognizing that the garbage trucks are, are the ones who are putting most of the heavy loads on, especially on your residential streets and, and um, accounting for that uh, in one way or another. And then uh, utility impacts, when the utilities come in and cut into a, a street, uh, cities have been and are exploring additional ways uh, to um, impose fees on those utility companies. And then there's some of the standbys using sales tax and uh, parcel tax in, uh, to be able to infuse more money with the, uh, into your system. And with that, that uh, concludes my presentation. Again, my hat's off to Steve for starting us off. He did just great. And uh, we're open to, and I'll turn it back over to Steve now. Steve, I thought maybe this would be a good time to see if council members had questions um, about Mr. Reary's, uh, on Mr. Reary's presentation. Uh, yeah, council member Bertrand. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, going back to the different, uh, Mr. Reary, um, if you would, going back to the different treatments, and you had a graph that at certain parts of the PCI, you did like slurry or a chip and something like that. Uh -huh. so what I'm trying to get is an idea of how much does that buy you? And you know, I'm sure there's a range depending on where it is in the PCI and how much you, you know, so if you started out with just small cracks because of, you know, buckling or, you know, temperature changes or something like that, as opposed to something that was even worse than that. And I, I'm just trying to get an idea what, what does each treatment buy you? You know, but does it improve for that segment, um, you know, five PCI points or 10 or 20? If you could just discuss that a little bit, thanks. Because it's you sort of like your bang for the buck. That's what I'm trying to get at. Right. Uh, great question, uh, Council Member Bertrand. Um, so you are 100% right. You get uh, 
a better bang for your buck uh, at different levels of the treat, uh, wherever that treatment is. And uh, if you're just filling cracks, um, for instance, a good crack seal program can, can preserve the pavement um, for three to five years. Um, slow seal treatments, which is a little bit further down on the, on the curve, uh, will give you anywhere from five to seven years of additional life. Uh, you start getting into your um, more heavier maintenance uh, type of, of treatments, your, your uh, chip seals and your cape seals, and you start getting anywhere from uh, seven to nine years of additional life. Uh, and then uh, this is with the assumption that you are doing the right treatment at the right time. Uh, but then if you're with your overlay streaks and your rehabilitation streaks, those always take the PCI from wherever they're at up to 100 and, and covers all of those distresses. But to your point, you're, you get a lot of, of uh, money from a life cycle cost point of view by focusing on the maintenance type of aspects where you're spending just a pennies per square foot and getting additional service life by by focusing on those. Does that help answer your question? You're on mute, council member. Okay. So, um, you know, I go to these Cal, uh, we have these meetings once a year, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for members of city councils. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people that are in your particular profession. So I know there's a, um, uh, additives that you could add you know, like uh, fiberglass or other types of things to make these pavements stronger. Um, do you have any opinion on those, or is it just a hype? You know, with um, right now, um, we're monitoring and, uh, and watching uh, what those different um, additives are doing. Unfortunately, with pavement projects or pavement products, um, we have to let it... Um, we have to observe it for up to 20 years in order to be able to see if it's really going to be cost effective. But I can tell you that there are a number of different um, companies that are trying to add fiberglass um, as as a as a state. We've been adding rubberized uh, crumb rubber tires to to pavements, and um, that actually is proving out to be very. Um, um, good in terms of its performance. Uh, even though it's just a little bit more expensive, it seems to be that rubberized products are giving more life expectancy than just conventional products. Uh, they're also experimenting with oils and additives to the oil and the binders that are holding the, the um, aggregates together. And so um, as an industry, we're really looking for lots of ways to be able to stretch the dollars, uh, but it takes time to be able to see if, it, if it's really going to be, um, if it's going to play out like we hope um, or, or as, I, as I hypothesize over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I guess I just wanted to, I have a couple questions and I'll save it till the very end, but the one I wanted to follow up on um, was in regard to the additives to the asphalt. And as you mentioned, the um, rubberized asphalt concrete, um, mm -hmm. the, the League of California Cities Transportation, Communication and Public Works uh, Policy Committee that met today, actually, and we got a presentation on this aggregated tire, um, you know, recycled tires that goes into the asphalt. And they were talking about how it's so durable and cost effective and, and cuts mm -hmm. down noise and whatnot. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, is that something, and maybe you already addressed this, is that something you would recommend for the city and or maybe Steve could tell us, is that something the city's already using? So um, when, with rubberized pavement, um, there, there is definitely some extended life um, possibilities depending on, on the needs of the pavement. Uh, with rubberized pavement, you can actually use less pavement if you're more in, if you're um, seeking to find um, crack retardation, if that's your, your driving force. 
And so not to get into too much uh, detail, if you can get enough quantity, then it does become very cost effective. Uh, the beautiful thing right now is as an industry, um, Caltrans is requiring that rubberized pavements be used uh, as the final lift on all of their pavement projects. And so if we were to rewind the clock about five years ago, it was not so easy for us to be able to recommend rubberized pavement because you would have to wait for your turn to get the specialized plant in order to be able to produce that product. But now with Caltrans using it more and more and requiring on every one of their projects, the that um, lack of material doesn't seem to be as, as uh, prominent anymore. And so um, we're able to recommend rubberized pavement much more. And there are times when I've seen it reduce the cost of a project significantly. Thank you. And Steve, can you tell, is that, is that anything where, I'm sorry, uh, Mayor Story, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just no, wanted that's, to. That's okay. Go ahead. To wrap that, that one up. Steve, is that something we're already doing or considering doing? We, we've considered rubberized asphalt um, in projects in the past. Unfortunately, the uh, quarries and the asphalt makers in Santa Cruz don't have the equipment, so it is a special setup and, and drives the cost up a little more than they're seeing probably over the hill and things like that. On our current uh, Clear Street project, we do have rubberized asphalt as an option um, that if we can get the cost great, we will use it. Um, but we have not, we've used rubberized slurry seals, but we have not used a rubberized asphalt. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's good to know that we're even using that uh, in our slurry seals. Great, thank you so much, gentlemen. I'll uh, save the rest of my questions for, for later in the presentation. All right, thank you. Are there um, any other council questions at this time? Um, seeing none, um, I, I did have a question, Mr. Reary. Um, with, um, you, know, you mentioned that our average uh, PCI was 54. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, how does that compare to comparable cities um, on the Central Coast or in our immediate area? Um, um, it, you're, you're right about average with the other cities that we've had an opportunity to work with. Um, there's some, there's information that I can provide Steve, uh, to be able to share with you, uh, that the, um, every year we put out an annual, um, um, uh, pavement report that is, uh, by the League of California Cities comparing all of the cities together throughout California. And I think that that would be a very fascinating thing for you to take a look at. Oh, I, I would be very interested in seeing that. So yeah, if you could send that to Steve and please um, um, and share it with all the council members. I, I, I would like to see it just to you know, see how we're doing relative to our, our neighbors. Um, and um, so, um, I just, I previously I did notice that we had a hand up um, from the attendees, uh, but that's come down now. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, send it over to you, Steve, to do um, the next part of the presentation. Okay. Let me uh, share my screen. And you can all see that now. So I'm going to be talking about a proposed schedule of streets for the next five years. Um, not a set and concrete schedule, something that's very fluid, and, but it gives us uh, targets to aim for. Before I get into the, the next list, um, Jamie had asked me to put together kind of a historic where we've been and, and, and the costs associated with it. So you can see this blue line here is the pave, our overall pavement condition index value since 2001. 2001, we were at 71, then we, five years later, um, we hadn't put any money in, we dropped down to a 56, and then we bounced around, and you see we bounced up to 66, down to 59, and right now we're at a 57, or we will be at the end of this year once we complete the 
Clear Street Project and the Road Resurfacing Project. Now, the orange line represents the cost to maintain that PCI every year. Um, so, in 2013, the cost to maintain a PCI of 59 was $650,000 a year. <clears throat> Four years later, when we had a PCI of 65, even though our PCI went up, the cost to maintain that PCI also went up to $750,000 a year. And now that we're at 57, <clears throat> the cost is $1.5 million. And I will say that Joe said $2 million a year. These costs include soft costs, such as design engineering, permitting, and things like that. Our two previous, 2013-2017, um, did not include those soft costs, so I took them out. So we're comparing the same figures here. So we're 1.5. And, and what I think that is, if we go to this chart, we're, we're, we keep slipping. Because we're not spending enough each year on our roads, we keep slipping back down a category, down a category. We're getting more reconstructs. Or over um, more chip seals instead of crack seals. And so we're just, we keep falling off this point. And this is where Joe's work called the critical point is so key. He's identifying and focusing on the streets we need to address here. Um, I can say I don't think we really did that before. I think it was more of spreading them out throughout the city, but he's really focused on which streets we need to address now. So I just wanted to cover that um, as we move forward here. Uh, Oh, so yeah, here's the list of projects that are ongoing now. Um, two slides really quick. So we are going to be resurfacing with a Cape Seal uh, Bay Avenue and all the way from the highway to Monterey Ave. The green areas indicate areas that we dug out previously. We'll also be doing a treatment, surface treatment on Sanmar. We did a dig out there. We're also able to, you know, wasn't in the original project, do a dig out on uh, Ferris Way with the request of the neighborhoods up there, there's a really bad area that we address, but we're not doing any surface treatment on that project as part, as part of this project running in the way. And we're also showing Clare Street and being down there. That's out the bid right now. We opened bids at the end of the month and uh, hopefully it'll certainly be done uh, by the end of this calendar year, probably late summer. And then the other parts of this project are um, Ruby Court, 42nd Avenue and Diamond, we're doing the resurfacing there. We did some dig out repairs on Capitol Road, and we're also doing 30th Avenue. 30th Avenue is on there, so it's actually a split street between us and the county. We were combining or partnering with the county on this street. It was in need of repairs, so it was added to this project, and we're kind of splitting the cost for that with the county at this point. So here's the list of streets, and I'll bring this list back up as we continue, broken down by year. Um, I'm not going to go through it all. I do have maps of each year, so I'm going to share that with you. But I just wanted to, here's the list that we'll be working on as we go forward. These are the road names that we will be covering, and then the, the limits from one end to the other. So first of all, by year, as you can see, um, in 2023, we're focusing on Capitol Avenue, and then we, you can see we try and group them into, into neighborhoods so that we don't have a contractor driving, driving across the uh, country town all the time. Mm -hmm. Looking at them by treatment, you can see what we, we have a lot of green. That's the light maintenance. Um, and you can do a lot of green for the same amount of money. We can do a little yellow, a little bit of yellow here, even less of the brown when we get into the rehabilitation. So what we, what Joe's tried to do in developing this list of streets was spread that around. So we take care of these streets that we can feel now or seal as part of this program and get them so they're not falling off into the next category. And same with these yellows, that's the next cheapest category to repair. But at the same time, we are doing some uh, rehabilitation work where it's necessary and reconstruction work. So we're, we're definitely want to mix up what we're doing rather than focusing on just one category. So looking at the year 2023, <clears throat> we're focusing on Capitol Road the emphasis and the real reason we're doing this, besides that it, it's the right time to at least stress this first section, the second section's already kind of dropped off, but since we're there, we can probably get some timely sales. So we do have a grant uh, from the RTC to help fund the intersection repairs there. That intersection probably is most need of repair of anything there. 
And um, so we want to take advantage of that grant funding um, in the first year of this program. I just want to mention that the Clare Street project also includes the intersection of 41st and Clare's and is being taken care of that project. And the grant is covering that work in this intersection work. So it's both sides of that. In 2024, we go for the, the slurry seals and light maintenance work, um, mainly focusing in the uh, in neighborhood, Riverview neighborhood, Cold Street, uh, Rosedale. I mean, these are streets that we paved in my tenure here, and it's definitely time to slurry them before we're reconstructing them. Uh, we're going to address Cherry and uh, Cliff Drive, 42nd Avenue, but we do include two. Uh, uh, reconstruction and a heavy maintenance on Raposa Ave and on 41st Ave uh, from Raposa up to Romer Street. In 2025, we come back and kind of do two medium-sized projects, um, focusing in the village area. Uh, we're doing some medium-sized maintenance on the Esplanade, San Jose, between Tap Ave and on Monterey. And then we're going to do some rehabilitation work on San Jose and Ferris and what we actually call the unnamed alley above Cherry Avenue here. Um, and those are in terrible shape. I think everybody knows that. And it gives us an opportunity to address those. Year 26, we will move to the Riverview, Clifford uh, Heights neighborhood, do some medium rehabilitation and probably some, well, um, Thin overlays and case seals in this area. And then in 2027, I've kind of driven this bus because the road, the stretch of 41st from the city limit up by Home Depot to Clare Street is in need of repairs. Um, we had the money I would push for today. We don't, it's going to take a while to gather that money. It's over a million dollars. I'll show that on the next slide. But it's something we need to keep aiming for and try and get this section, probably the busiest surface street in the county of Santa Cruz, um, addressed and resurfaced. Uh, we did do a slurry seal between Rose Road and Claire's about 17 years ago, I believe it was. That's now gone. Um, the street is cracking and we're starting, we're seeing deflections, especially on the ramps. So we are responsible for the ramps up to the bridge at 41st on each side. Even though it's, these parts are in Caltrans territory, um, we're responsible for the surface streets. So we put that at the end of the project. Um, certainly there'll be grant opportunities uh, that will come up and if we do get grant opportunities and we can take advantage of those grant opportunities, uh, we will be recommending moving this up if that grant funding becomes available. So looking at the funding, Excuse me, 2023, we do the project as we currently finalize about $1.2 million. And we have 540 of measure D and SB1 as our primary and only dedicated sources of paid or transportation funding, which we're in the city pretty much dedicated to pavement improvements. We also have the 250000 dollars grant. So we have a slight gap here. We're hoping we'll make it up with an additional grant, or we can make adjustments in the project scope in the treatments here, but I, I, I'm very confident we can address the entire project and, and keep it, uh, either reduce the cost here or increase the funding. The next few years, we're slightly over our $540,000 budget, but there's always um, carryover in these two funds and we'll probably have money left over from the projects that are going on now, the Claire's and the street resurfacing projects that we can apply to those. So I'm comfortable being in the $600,000 range for each year with only $540,000 funding identified at this point. By dedicating this funding here, again, we'll be able to figure out and adjust these projects accordingly as more funding becomes available or the treatments that we finally do. And then there's the large 41st Avenue project, which is a $1.7 million project. Um, and those are $2027. So, we need to find quite a bit of grants, about $1.2 million in grants, and we will certainly be working on that. So that is my, rec or my uh, presentation. Um, the recommendation is to approve a five-year list of street improvements 
and or at least the schedule and direct staff to prepare a resolution. So we have to adopt a, resol a resolution informing the state how we intend to spend our SB1 funds next year. So we will be bringing that to you at the next meeting on June 23rd. I just wanna say that, you know, the schedule is not cast in stone. It's certainly something the council uh, can give us direction on. Joe and I can try and adapt and uh, make changes on the fly. If we wanna try and finalize it tonight or you can give us some direction and we can back, bring back the final list of improvements in the schedule when we bring the resolution back at the next meeting. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. So um, as far as direction goes, are, are we looking at specific streets or are we just looking at maybe the level of deterioration and where we could focus funding first, like how you're saying, we have ones that we can sort of patch up or we have ones that are in the the more needy areas and where, do, I guess, is, are we looking just more for where we want to focus our dollar or a specific street for the direction? At this point, the specific street. We've done our best to try and do the critical management and address streets that are falling off, you know, Falling into the next category. That's where Joe okay. done his work. So, but if you have a street or if there's neighborhoods or something like that that you think we need to address, um, we can try and accommodate it and make sure we put it in the right category so that we're not taking all those flurry dollars and putting them in the rehabilitation, which is not what we want to do. So, gotcha. um, I won't okay. promise we'll be able to meet if there's a request for a specific street, but we'll try our best um, to figure that out. But we do would like to finalize. A list either tonight or at the next meeting of streets we're going to work on. Okay, great. Thank you. Council Member Brooke. Thank you, Mayor Story. Steve, um, what in, in planning this list of streets and the timeline here, how did you incorporate council's priorities? I know that we all, you know, like we brought up Fanmar, for instance, as a priority and set that as a priority, but I'm seeing it here for 2025. Um, I know that council also, like there was like conversations that we had about council priorities on streets, and I'm guessing they're all in here somehow, some way. I'm just wondering how that was incorporated in this timeline. So Fanmar, we're actually addressing in the next month. Uh, the fan more you see here is the end location for work on Terrace Way and the alley um, above Cherry. So fan more has been addressed. Um, a lot of the, as I reviewed, Joe came up with the first list and then I tried to balance it with the council goals. I know there was interest in dealing with Capitol Road, which is in here. There's always interest in dealing with the uh, Terrace and San Jose were, have been mentioned in the past. They're, I'm not aware that there's a, a, a list of the council goals of the streets to work on, um, but the ones I'm aware of, we did work into here and work with Joe to try and balance it out. As far as which years they're getting undressed in, there's probably more flexibility, although Joe would probably say that dealing with the, the slurry seals and uh, light maintenance in 2024 is critical to keep track of the streets before they go any further. Um, Jamie, so this is a question then for you. Do you recall us having, a, I, I don't think it was this year for goals and priorities, but we definitely, when Steve created the spreadsheet for us and showed us in, uh, you know, what the worst streets are, and we decided on the slurry seal and all of that sort of stuff, I recall us all identifying certain streets um, that we wanted to include that's that's the list i'm talking about that it wasn't this year i believe it was last year um that we did that and again um is there are all of those streets because i don't have that in front of me are all of those streets incorporated here my recollection is steve do you think you could back up a couple slides i think you you were showing us what we are doing this month my recollection is, is that all of the streets that we identified during that goal setting process when we were identifying our street projects, those were, those are all getting done here just right now. 
So it's this Bay Avenue section Steve is showing us. You can see Sandmar there with a little bit of um, repair on Terrace. Yep. Ruby Court, 42nd Diamond. Yeah, those are the same. Okay. And then my, my, my last question then is when you say that we're, we're working on them, does that mean we still need to find funding to eventually complete them? Is this phase one, phase two, phase, you know, there's so many different phases. Um, and I, I'm seeing that in your projections from year to year, but I'm just wondering, again, how, how are you balancing that, for instance, with Sandmark? So the, these ongoing 22 projects, these, these streets on this slide are completely funded. The contract is awarded. It's the one we did in conjunction with the county in partnership with the county. They are starting work uh, next week, not necessarily in Capitola, it's a county-wide project. Um, I don't know the schedule they'll be in Capitola, but they will be completing this project in June, July, and parts of August. And all these streets are already funded and under contract to be repaired. Claire's is the only one that is not under contract. It is out the bid right now. And we'll, like I said earlier, we will be receiving bids at the end of this month. And it is fully funded. Um, once the bids come in, we're only anticipating, and I I'm feel confident about that. So these projects are, will be done um, by the end of this right. month. Um, and then my final question is um, in relation to, I'm just thinking about SoCal Creek water, digging up our beautiful new slurry field <laughs> roads, you know, out, out here. Um, have you worked with any of, with them or any of the other agencies that could possibly be needing to work on anything like that? So if I think about like the extension of AT&T fiber, you know, going into the ground, we're undergrounding some utility things all of that sort of stuff, does that have any impact on this particular plan or have you looked into that already? So we have requested um, repair plans from, or repair schedules from the utility, sewer, water, and pg &E. And once we have an adopted list, we will share the, our list with them so that they uh, we will coordinate. And that part where I said the, the schedule's not cast in concrete, it's flexible. If we find out that SoCal Creek needs to replace a, a water main on the street we have scheduled in there. We will either delay or work with them and make sure we're after them. So we are actively doing that at this time. I appreciate that. And I only look at it at that, this angle because of it being a potential um, financial gain. For, you know, like maybe they could help cover the cost after they've dug some things up. Yeah. So that's, that's why I mentioned it. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, before your presentation started, I had a specific question about how the streets were prioritized by year. You know, how, what would get what work done in, in what year, um, and what treatment would those those streets be getting? But I think you've covered it. So if you could just make sure that that I understand it correctly, that essentially these streets have been prioritized based on preventing them from falling into the next level of disrepair. Um, based on the selective type of, of rehabilitation that they may need. So I, I understand that correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I would say the only um, variation of that is Capitol Road got pushed up just because of the available funding for that project. Okay, that makes sense. And then my other question is, I, I noticed that some of the streets for 2025, um, I, I think, yeah, if you could go back to the map. 2025. Yeah, so we've got San Jose. Um, I want to say Monterey was there, but I don't. Monterey, just from Capitol Ave down into the Esplanade area. Okay. It's not the upper part of Monterey at all. So I noticed that these are kind of in the rehabilitation mode as opposed to the kind of slurry, just fixer upper mode. And I'm wondering if by 2025, are they in heavy re rehabilitation mode? at that year because we weren't able to address them in years prior or are they already kind of teetering on that so you know that they're 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 already at that point i guess what i'm trying to determine is these streets that would require heavy re rehabilitation in 25 would they only require light rehabilitation in 23 or slurry this year um 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, I can tell you, I'll let Joe answer part of this question, but I'll start out with San Jose Terrace and the alleyway up there are, are rehabilitation right now. Um, they're, they're just in poor shape. But Joe, can you address the yellow areas and, and what's going on there? Yeah, when you're looking, really good question, Council Member Brown, with the with your insight there. The um, we're trying to factor in uh, exactly where where they're at right now, um, and and look slightly ahead when you're looking at the, the years. And so we anticipate that these streets will require a light rehabilitation. To answer your question. Can they use a, a treatment right now that would be less than that? No, the, these streets are already in that, that light rehabilitation category. We're, off, we're just trying to catch them before they, they fall into the heavy rehabilitation category. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I know some people, um, when they tell me this is the, the worst street in the city and we need to do something about it right now, it sounds like if it's in need of heavy re rehabilitation now, it's going to be in need of heavy rehabilitation in three years. But in those three years, we need to prevent the streets that need light rehabilitation from falling into heavy rehabilitation so that three years from now, we don't have twice as many streets in that condition. Is that a general? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you got it. That's, it's, that's a super important thing to, to wrap your head around when it comes to pavement management. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Hey, um, the question is from other council members at this time. Um, and then um, I had a question, um, you know, concerning particular streets and um, and the ones that um, on the list uh, in your report, Mr. Weary, um, that have the lowest CPI uh, but are not on this list that you prepared to see. Um, and I'm not sure if I captured in all, but just for example, um, 40th Avenue uh, has a PPI of 17. Um, a portion of Monterey, I think the upper portion of Monterey has a PPI of 19. Uh, Oakland has a PPI of 12. And Escalona has a PPI of 20. Um, mm -hmm. I think those were the significant ones. Um, and um, I would just, Trying to, I mean, it, it would seem to me that those would at least be worth putting on the list so that we could recognize that those are the streets that are in the worst condition uh, or the, have the lowest current PPI scores, maybe already in the state of needing, um, you know, reconstruction. Um, so I was just one, I guess I wanted to ask about the feasibility of. Of, of putting uh, streets that have low CPI um, on the list so that they're at least on the radar um, and as a, you know available funding comes together we are able to capture um, all of these low scoring streets um, and I know that probably gets to your you know bottom up uh, approach which we do not absolutely want to do um, but I think for the public, they don't won't necessarily um, understand that nuance about why why my street's really bad. Why don't you focus on that instead of doing the one over in the next neighborhood? Um, so I guess I would just like to see is it see from your perspective is it possible to put some of these low scoring streets um, on the list so that they're on our radar. So do you want to first address the, um, you know, just restate kind of why we're, we don't just do the bottom up technique and then uh, I'll address the other part. Yeah, sure. I, exactly um, to that point, if a street is, is under 25, the likelihood of it meeting a uh, reconstruct is going to be the same today tomorrow, next year, even even five years away from now. And so when you have limited money, like the city of Capitola has, you're trying to capture those streets 
um, that are going to are going to cost less um, before they before they cost more. And so, with that with that said, we look at all of those streets, and then we're also looking at at where where the other streets are and on their tipping points and that critical point part. And if we can save the street for less money, then that's where we were trying to focus our dollars. Now, what I have seen uh, done, Mayor Story, uh, in situations like this is that you can take a group of streets that usually are the worst streets in town, like, like the ones that you mentioned, streets with uh, 17 and 19 and 20 PCIs that are in definitely failed mode. You're, you focus, you can have those streets and then as funding becomes available for those streets, then you can start putting money towards that. I would, I would really strongly advocate for you to stay with this list because it's going to give you the biggest impact over the longest period of time um, because it really is touching as many streets as you possibly can at, at this point. But then track those other streets and so as money be does become available from other sources, you can jump on those streets. Thank you. Thank you for that response. And I'll follow up. I think we can create a list of the um, PCI streets under 25 and have that be an agency here on this list. If we can't schedule it, we just know we're not going to have that money available um, in the next five years. But as money becomes available, um, if we do get excess money, we could, we could look at those streets then on that list and move forward with them if the council directs. Right. Um, well, I'm not come back, but I just want to confirm. You did ask us to point out streets that we thought should be on the list. And so I'm responding to that statement. Um, <laughs> Vice Mayor Geiger, thank you, thank you Mr. Freire. Um, Vice Mayor Geiger. Thank you. Uh, this is street specific. Um, and this may be a new point. I'm not sure. But so when we can talk um, about our budget and goal setting and the idea of sort of rehabbing or putting money towards rehabbing the Stockton Bridge itself, would that impact any pavement sort of rehabilitation that we would do on, on Stockton Bridge Ave? Like, I just, I would just wouldn't want to like pay any attention to Stockton Bridge Ave, the pavement itself, if then moving forward with fixing the bridge would impact that or mess it up in any way. And that's my technical terminology that I have about that. So um, if you could enlighten me on that, that would help. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Vice Mayor um, The money that's in the proposed budget for the Stockton Avenue Bridge is actually flood protection money. It's um, trying to build some diverters upstream of the bridge to prevent logs from catching on the uh, piers that go into the creek. So we will not be addressing at all the, the condition of the road surface on the, the bridge. Uh, it's simply a flood protection project. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you. I had uh, one more quick question that I had forgotten to ask previously. And I'm not sure if this is the, the right time for this question. So Steve, maybe you can tell me. I had some, um, some folks reach out recently with some concerns about our um, essentially our road markings, like some of our crosswalks in the village, um, not quite aligning with the curb cuts and some of the, the other markings in the road. Would that be the kind of discussion, you know, repairing those or making new street markings? Would that be part of this discussion or would that be a separate discussion to be had at another time? So as far as curb ramps, just we do, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong here, if we do anything above a light maintenance, we're required to update the curb ramps um, in that area. So I do believe the area that I've been concerned about is the San Jose and Stockton, or San Jose and Cap Ave. And we do have, you know, San Jose is on there. So when we go to address San Jose in 2025, I believe it is, we will address those ramps. As far as paint markings and all that, the city crews will be doing some um, 
refreshing the paint in the legends and crosswalks in the village and throughout the city, um, hopefully starting at the end of this month. So we'll be addressing that, but the, the hard concrete changes um, will come as we do street improvements um, in, in that area. Perfect, thank you so much. Hey, any other questions from council members? Um, yeah, none. I'm going to take this opportunity to just to check in with members of the public, see if there's anyone there that would uh, like to make a comment. If you do, just please raise your hand in the Zoom application, or you can dial star nine. You'll be given three minutes to speak, um, or you may send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us and um, um, a moderator will read your message for up to three minutes. And so, uh, Larry, looks like we have a couple of hands up. Yes, Mayor Starr, we have two attendees with their hands up. Um, first one is uh, Heidi Kellison. Yes, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Story and council members. My name is Heidi Kellison. I live on Sanmar, and I'd first like to thank staff and the council for the current work that is underway on Sanmar. As you know, our street is quite the thoroughfare for beach goers, especially those who've missed the lot behind us. And so uh, we do appreciate what's to come in, in phases two and three on Sanmar. I'm uh, authorized by about 20 households on Sanmar Terrace and Upper Cherry, as we like to refer to it, to advocate on their behalf. And so tonight I'm turning my attention to Upper Cherry and Terrace. The um, slope on Terrace in particular is a problem because the rains do support the degradation of that surface at a higher rate than other streets. It's an extreme slope, so I just call your attention to that. As well, we have no sidewalks in the area, so pedestrians are required to use the streets. We've had local residents with injuries, and that is going to get worse. So I would encourage you to consider moving the repairs on these streets up, especially because we're already in that orange range. Um, and I believe that's the information of my comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Callison. Your story, we have Kate Watts. Yes, my name is Ms. Watts. Hi, everybody. Um, I am one of those people that was injured on Terrace. I've been a 12-year resident of Terrace. Um, and it wasn't on the giant pothole, which has been mercifully patched over, that was in front of my house. Actually, it was a bit, a bit further up the street. And again, um, the degradation of the street, I think, you know, that I'm sure it has a very low, uh, given the, what I've learned tonight, which has actually been pretty interesting about um, pavement management. At any rate, um, uh, the street uh, is, functions a lot more like an arterial street during busy weekends and in the summer than it does as a residential street, the span march this way. And I think in addition to the steep slope that um, Heidi just mentioned, um, the very, I'm sure, very low PCI of these two streets, and Terrace in particular, um, that the, the idea that it is functioning not even more like an arterial street now, um, given the uptick in traffic in the COVID um, and um, events that are great, like this weekend, these two streets get a lot of traffic. And um, so I would just like to finish with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Watt. Sorry, I do not see any other attendees with their hands raised on this topic, and we have not received any emails on this item. Okay. Um, well, then uh, I will bring this back to council. Um, and I was wondering, Steve, if you, you could, um, you know, I heard a request about moving Sanmar. I, I noticed that both Sanmar and Cherry are on the list. Um, and then, um, uh, I'm sorry. Terrace, um, and um, uh, and we we are currently working on Sanmar, but um, is, is it would it be feasible to move up um, the Paris Way um, work? 
So you're talking about swapping out years 2024 and 2025. Um, I guess I'd, I'd ask Joe how critical it is we get the, the minor maintenance, the light maintenance done in 2024 versus 2025. What you want to, yeah, Steve and, and Mayor Story, to, to answer your question, what what you're running the risk of is are those streets that that are currently only needing a, a light maintenance um, that may include a couple of localized repair dig outs and a slurry seal on them for those uh, conditions to expand and and then you're you're dealing with larger repair areas and maybe even being able to apply a light maintenance on them um, that's why they're in there where they're at uh, because we need to pick those up um, as soon as possible um, I understand what you're saying and and understand the concerns on on terrace it is not in great shape. Um, maybe one of the things uh, and that we might be able to deal with is, is maybe a little bit of localized repair. I might suggest that you consider some localized repair on, on that. Um, uh, but you are going to pay some premium for mobilizing the contractor over to that street. And so, again, you're trying to balance your dollars. But I don't think I would move it, to be honest. Okay, thank it you. It would be my recommendation. Right. Thank you for that response. Um, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I, I think maybe I, I had the same question was, you know, is it possible to do even a slurry seal or some basic repairs up on Terrace before we get to it for some kind of larger repairs? Um, are there real? Are there any alternatives other than just there's nothing to be done until 2025? I mean, if the recommendation is not to move it up for for more extensive work, is there any other alternative, or is it kind of just there's not a lot of answers until then? Um, I think we, we could prioritize um, some more spot repairs more than anything. Um, a slurry seal would really be inefficient to put a slurry down and come back and see your, you know, and tear that all out. Um, but as Joe mentioned, we could do some structural repairs increase. We did do one on Paris uh, earlier this year. We could try and do more spot repairs as part of um, a, a future project that will be next year. Um, we can work that into the 2024 schedule as far as um, you know, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be addressing the worst streets, but we could address, uh, try and address uh, multiple potholes in worst areas in the street um, in 2024. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I do think if there's um, consensus among, among the council that we should at least try to get some um, repairs on on Paris. Um, in the time being, the the outreach that I've gotten from community members has been about Paris and Monterey. Um, and I see that Monterey might take a little bit more work um, in a couple of years, but Terrace, I, I do have concerns about. And so I, I would encourage uh, my fellow council members, if you would agree, uh, that we should at least do some kind of pothole repair up there um, until we can get to larger repairs. Thank you. I, I think you started us off on the deliberative part uh, of this agenda item. Um, and so let's let's continue in that vein now, and I'll call on uh, Councilmember Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Steve, I appreciate you looking at alternatives to address Terrace Way. Um, my, what I'm not an expert in knowing is how much your time um, has been in already addressing the the potholes and going out, and and so with Mr. Reary, uh, I I'm sorry, Mr. Joe, I can't, I don't can't say your last name. I don't remember how to say it, but I don't want, I don't want to mess it up. So I'm going to call you Mr. Joe for right now. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but I just know, Steve, that you've spent a lot of time out there already and that costs money. And so I'm just wondering with this alternative, that's still more time. And I just wonder if it, in the end, is going to cost us the same 
in, you know, in 2025 addressing it. And, and so my point is, it's like, would it be better just to deal with it now instead of waiting to 2025 financially? Because it costs time. There's our, your time, our, our team's time, you know, the spot repairs. I know that you went out and fixed one and then had to send the team back out there because it rained. And, you know, there's just a lot of that. So um, I'll wait for your response. But either way, I, I support what Council Member Brown is saying and that we do need to address this now. So how about we offer up a, a swap here? We pull we're close to out of the now, out of 2024, and insert Terrace Way. They're both reconstruction. They're approximately the same length. I'm not sure the costs are identical, but I think we can try and deal with that. And um, we'll just go forward with it in that direction, if that would be acceptable. I think that's great. Yeah, no, um, you know, I think that that would, that would be workable. And, and, and I think the point of that I was trying to make, I think it's good to, um, you know, acknowledge the streets that are in the worst CPI condition in the sense of having them on the list. Um, and Steve, you used in your description about how best to allocate it. But even if they're on the list, I feel, you know, um, we want to do this um, and, and make our dollars go as far as possible over the long term. And so it would be um, your exercise of judgment and with the advice of Mr. Reary, if we have limited dollars, here's where we put them. But we may um, have grants, we may have, um, and the one thing, and if the council and future councils see the streets, and they're acknowledged to be in bad condition, it may, you know, motivate them uh, to work harder to, to come up with additional money. Um, but if not, um, then yeah, we spend the money in the most efficient way um, possible. Um, and but I also think, you know, in this fashion, the you know a resident sees that yeah, that they recognize that this street needs work. Okay. And I think that they would understand. Um, so we have limited dollars, um, and that some streets may take a little bit longer than others. Um, so those are my comments. And and, and Steve, I, I heard you say that you would maybe list, you know, try to identify those streets that were below CPI of 25. Um, and so um, I think that um, that would be. I mean that would be acceptable to me. I don't know how the other council members feel about it, but um, I'll um, maybe open it up uh, to them for um, a possible uh, resolution here or a motion to approve a resolution. No, I think there's a resolution on tonight. We're coming back to the resolution. Tonight, uh, yeah, well, yeah, the direction is to prepare a resolution which would come back on uh, June the 23rd. Okay, so that's the motion. Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, I, um, I heard Steve say something like, at least on terrace, that you could look at some uh, patchwork there. Um, did I get you correct, Steve? And are there things there that might help address the a resident that spoke up. That, that's my follow-up question. I, I did mention doing patching, but I've also mentioned the feasibility of swapping out tariffs in 2025 with proposal in 2024. They're approximately the same one. Um, maybe Joe can give you a thumbs up if you the dollars or not. But we can always come back in a minute. Um, but I'm pretty comfortable saying I know proposal is a reconstruct, and I know the tariffs there's a reconstruct, so we would swap those two out um, is, is an option the council can consider. Okay, so the patching would be not really very feasible in terms of time spent and dollars, et cetera. Swapping would be a more reasonable uh, way to address the issues. Yeah, I mean, pa patching would certainly alleviate the, the worst areas, but it would not address the entire street. Um, so 
the statute would so quickly you won't need to get to terror. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't understand how you, you know, the, the sequence of work, but, you know, the, the lady that spoke talked about um, injuries up on that street, and I'm not too sure of the specifics, but if the patching requires something of that order, then maybe that's something that's more of an immediate issue. So I'm not, I've walked up and down that street many times, so I'm just not familiar with what she's talking about. Yeah, I'm prepared to make um, a motion if yeah. you want to pull that up. Um, yeah, before you do, Council Member Brooks, oh, I'll come right back to you. I think Mr. Reary had something to add. I, I was just going to um, make the comment that that um, knowing that a street is in poor condition like Paris, you're going to have to treat as part of, of uh, the heavier rehabilitation, you have to treat the base sailed areas. So by coming in and treating those base sailed areas now, um, eliminate that portion of the work from the future um, from the future year. So that's why I was suggesting that maybe you could uh, do localized repairs because then I saw that not taking away from what would happen in future years, you just aren't going to get it as cost effective as you would if you were dealing with it when you're dealing also with San Jose and those other streets that are right in that localized area. Um, but we need to look at what um, Steve is suggesting with swapping out um, Raposa with, with Terrace because that also might be um, they're they're not the same. They're not the same in terms of uh, dollars wise, but that that's something that we could take a look at if you want to move Paris ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. pretty comfortable that we can swap out enough streets to make it work if the council chooses to prioritize Paris, uh, and we may try and lump San Jose in there since they're connected, but. Um, we can include that if that's the council's direction. Okay. Um, before I'll come right back to you, Councilmember Brooks, with the motion, but um, I, I'll see uh, Councilmember Brown. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify something because I know we're all really eager to get work done as fast as we possibly can. Based on what we've heard tonight, it sounds like 2022, we already know what we're doing this year. We've got those things figured out. Nothing's going to happen this year that hasn't already been planned for. 2023, we had, um, it was just Capitola Avenue, I think, because there were some pretty intense projects with some grant funding that we need to use. So the earliest that we can really program anything is 2024. So even if we were going to do some kind of repairs, pothole kind of stuff on Terrace, that would be 2024 anyway. And so what we're talking about now is instead of just potentially doing some pothole repair up there, let's switch out. Paris for Raposa and actually do the work that we need to do, all of it. Mm -hmm. Am I understanding that correctly? So if, if we just did some localized base repairs and, and patching out there, that's something that probably could be done outside of this program. That's really not part of the pavement management program. That's part of something we could do with gas tax funds or something like that. Um, so that's not considered part of the pavement management improvement project, I guess we use it, steal that term. Um, but if you want to address the whole road at one point, that's part of this program and what we need to know. But potentially we could do some patching up there um, as early as next spring, uh, depending on how the, once we get some estimates and, and I figure out what the worst areas are. But that would not be anywhere near they complete road projects. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to Councilmember Brooks now and see if we can get a motion on the floor. Yeah, if you want to pull up the staff. I'm working on it. Um, so here's the list, or do you want the recommendations? The recommendations, great. Um, so, Steve, now that I have your attention, <laughs> um, I just want to be sure that council hears tonight that if there's any damage, more damage done to Terrace or anything, your team would be out there making repairs no matter what. Um, 
and 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 supporting Harris. That that's going to be the plan that um, that we can do. Um, what I want to make sure is that in this motion that I make to switch Harris and Raposa in this actual plan is that Raposa also gets that same attention in dealing with what you called spot repairs or pay, you know going out and just ensuring that they're also taken care of because I don't want to switch them and then we forget about them. They're obviously on this list for a reason and punting it a year later to address it um, is you know can't it, is a bit complicated and I, I just want to make sure that that street is addressed. So um, I'd, I'd like to approve uh, make a motion to approve a proposed five-year list of street improvement schedule and direct staff to prepare a resolution for adoption at the June 23rd City Council meeting, approving the list of streets receiving 2223 road repairs and rehabilitation using the SB1 fund um, and switching Raposa and Terrace on the time on the schedule. I'll second. Can I request a, a, an amendment to that motion, um, which would also uh, include um, listing the streets that have CCI currently below 25? I'll accept that amendment. Okay. And does the second accept that amendment? Yes, but can you clarify just listing them as priority when we can get to them or in a certain year or? Well, I think I was going to leave that at Steve and Mr. Rary's discretion as to in which year um, they would be listed. Um, okay. But also understood that even within that context, there's going to be limited dollars. Um, and it's going to, I think, we would rely on Steve uh, to make the best judgment within a given year how best to use those dollars. Um, and if all the streets can't be handled, then they get carried over. Um, so it, that, that's the purpose of my, um, my request for the amendment. Okay, I'm okay with that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, are there any other comments on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Councilmember Bertrand. Approved. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you, Mr. Reary, um, and uh, for your work um, on, on our uh, street infrastructure. And thank you once again, Steve. Uh, thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. Yeah. Um, next, we'll go to item 8B, which is a potential second home tax follow up. The recommended action is to receive a report regarding potential second home tax and either one, provide policy input regarding structure for a second home tax for the November ballot and direct staff to prepare documentation necessary to place an item on the ballot, or two, determine not to propose a second home tax to voters at this time. So we have a staff report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Give me a second, I'll share my screen. How does that look, Larry? Looks good. Great. All right, Mayor and Council. So this is a follow-up to the discussion. I'm getting a little bit of background noise. Is that coming from from a, a muted mic? If that helps take care of it. Okay, so two weeks ago we got a presentation from Gene Bregman who presented the results of his poll that looked into the potential of a second home town. So while the results showed the initial plurality of support, over 50% support for a second home tax, the support waned when additional information was presented in the form of arguments both for and against the second home tax. Um, unfortunately, based on additional legal research, staff believes it's very likely that because it would be a tax on property, that it would require a 66% margin to pass which is gonna be a pretty heavy lift 
given that we saw, I think our highest item pulled at about 58%. From the poll, you'll see these were some of the serious issues that the voters called out. Uh, there was concern about affordable housing, need to maintain the beaches, the effects of climate change here in our local community, traffic congestion, and the need to maintain police and emergency public safety programs as our highest priority issues that were identified. Interestingly enough, after the discussion this evening, you see that the condition of streets and roads um, did not pull as high as it has in the past. Again, here's a quick summary of the results that we saw. On your left, you can see this 55%. This was the first time we asked the question of a $6,000 and a $3,000 second home tax. Um, and then this was asking that same question about a $4,000 and $2,000 second home tax. When I say the two different numbers, what I mean is 4,000 for a single family home and 2,000 for a condominium. And then you can see here asking after arguments in favor and against um, of the proposed tax, how the support generally waned and fell right at about the 50% margin. To me, a lot of that indicates that number one, people aren't familiar with this concept of a second home tax or vacant home tax. Uh, and two, there's probably a lot of room to move people's opinions based on either a campaign or education effort. So at the hearing, we identified a number of items to follow up on. They included, um, well, let's not go through each one of these here because I'm going to go through them in the slides. This is just an outline of what's to come. But these were the items that were identified during our last hearing when council asked us to come back with more information. So the first item I'm going to cover is the threshold to qualify for the tax. What are we taxing? So in Oakland, they set theirs up as a tax on properties that are occupied less than 50 days per year. Uh, there's a proposed ordinance that's going to go to voters, we believe, in November, assuming the signatures qualify it, that would require occupancy for 120 days per year. It's obviously a much higher bar than the proposed ordinance in Santa Cruz essentially meaning that the home needs to be occupied for four months out of the year, where in Oakland, if, if it's occupied for a little bit less than two months, it's not subject to the tax. So for each one of these items, I'm putting out a staff suggestion here as we go through it, and then at the end, there'll be a summary chart with where all the staff suggestions kind of included in one place. My suggestion would be to set an occupancy threshold in the 60 to 90 range, um, that would be less strict than Santa Cruz and kind of more on par with what's being done in Oakland. Um, it seems as if somebody's living in their place more than three months out of the year, it's less of a second home, uh, up to council's discretion. But that's, that was kind of the thinking behind the 60 to 98 threshold. The higher the threshold, the more homes would likely be impacted. So if you put the threshold at 120 days, like the city of Santa Cruz, we likely would capture more homes than if you put it down at 60. Um, the question came up about the potential tax rate. Both the Oakland and the proposed ordinance in Santa Cruz set a rate at $6,000 for single family homes and three for condominiums and townhomes. The polling data you just saw in a previous slide showed that 54% initial support for those levels. And then you saw we got about a four point bump by dropping it to 4,000 and 2,000. And if we are going to pursue this, I think we're going to need all the point bumps we can get. Um, so I would suggest trying it at four and two if we decide to move forward. The exemption. So the exemptions list, what this is intended to do is I don't think any of the ordinances that anyone has contemplated so far are intended to penalize someone if they have a medical emergency and have to spend significant time in the hospital or for very low income households who maybe through some sort of odd situation end up with multiple properties or um, in the course of the owner passing away and the property is going through probate. So I looked at what you saw at the Oakland ordinance, what was proposed in Santa Cruz, and this, uh, this is my suggested list of exemptions. It would include very low income households, medical events, demonstrated financial hardship, active construction, 
the owner passing away, as I mentioned, the property is going through some sort of inheritance process, natural disasters, um, short-term vacation rentals wouldn't be subject to this, and then there'd be some leniency around property sales um, as well. Enforcement options, this has been something staff has done a fair amount of research into and council asked about last time. I will actually be meeting with Soquel Creek to take a look at some of their water data tomorrow with our finance staff. Our thought is, is that the basic mechanism is, is that staff would review the utility data and go through with some basic screens to take our 4,500 single, our 4,500 housing units in the city and screen it down to those homes that are using less water, that are using maybe no water during winter months, and then doing a deeper dive into the, the properties that you've screened uh, as being potential second homes. What we're proposing we would then do is issue a notice, initial determination notice, and then the homeowner could provide information, additional information about if they qualify for an exemption, or if you know, staff's determination is wrong. After reviewing the information provided by a homeowner, then we would issue basically a draft final determination notice, and we would propose an external hearing officer, much as we do with our parking tickets, someone who isn't in City Hall, who's outside the city, would make the final determination if someone were to appeal uh, the determination of occupancy. There are two other questions we'll cover on this slide. Uh, there's questions about the impact and how this, this potential tax could affect ADUs. Um, staff doesn't suggest establishing any sort of, sort of occupancy threshold specific ADUs. Not, it wasn't included in either the Oakland or the Santa Cruz examples. Uh, instead, it would really require occupancy on the residential property. So if you had a home, you're living in it, there's no requirement for you to do something special with your ADU. We're talking about somebody living on the property um, beyond the threshold, the specified number of days per year. And then there was questions about placing an item on the ballot. The actual ballot costs are relatively low because we are participating in this election. As our clerk mentioned at the outset of the meeting, we'll be looking for new council members um, and hopefully seeing some existing council members continue. Uh, so the ballot cost would be probably under $5,000. The more significant cost is probably the legal research uh, necessary to prepare the ordinance. Uh, for those of you who have participated in previous tax measures, you'll recall that the ordinance itself is pretty simple to put together. It's usually just changing one line in our TOT ordinance from 8% to 10%. This is different. This is more complicated in that it's really creating an entire new structure for what this tax would look like. In addition, these tax are new. Taxes are new. Um, Oakland is the only established one in the state of California. So we need to make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's and make sure that the, the ordinance is as well prepared as possible. So there's a chunk of money in time that would be necessary for us to invest in putting that ordinance together. There were questions about the financial impact of the tax, and that's a relatively difficult one for me to estimate. According to the census, there were 410 vacant or second, sorry, second or vacation homes in Capitola, and then an additional 104 other vacant. I do not know how accurate the census data are for Capitola, but using them, you can see in this table assuming how many people qualify for exemptions and different assumptions on the number of units that qualify and then varying tax rates, uh, I can come up with an estimate of between uh, $2.2 million and $850,000 a year. So my guess is we'd be somewhere in the middle, um, but really it's very hard to know. We think that the initial uh, enforcement effort uh, would probably be in the $20,000, $30,000 range to really go through the data. And then once we had a system in place, a uh, relatively simple process each year, we do anticipate it may necessitate a uh, you know, few hours bump in the finance department, but we would really need to, see, uh, need to see exactly what the data looks like and what the workload is associated with it. 
Um, as I mentioned before, the 66% threshold would certainly be challenging. Um, I also mentioned this before. I think that because the concept is new, I think voters intuitively really would under, uh, understand in a poll what a change in a sales tax would mean to them. Uh, I imagine, I don't know this for a fact, that there was a fair amount of questions for folks at the first time they heard about this. And maybe some people were concerned that they may be subject to the tax when they go on vacation or other things along those lines. So potentially there's more room for opinions to change with the campaign. Um, I certainly can't guarantee it. Um, at the last meeting, we did talk about having some outreach with you know, people who may have some concerns about this. And so far, no significant opposition has been identified. Um, and so then I think the real trick would be identifying specific uses for the tax that are consistent with the high priority voter issues and also potentially help to energize the campaign. And what I mean by that is you know, what are the issues that people would hit the streets and go door to door for? You know, is it funding for seniors? Is it funding for youth? Is it funding for the environment? Is it for roads? Those kinds of things. And I think, you know, that's something council really, I think, has expertise in is, is where are the passions in our community. And staff would suggest, the only suggestion I would have on the uses here would be to consider a split between a couple of maybe high priority issues that really energize folks and the general fund. Um, because I think as everybody knows, we have general fund challenges for sure. Um, so I think, you know, whether it's 50% for the general fund and 25 and 25 for two key issues, something along those lines. So as a reminder, um, tonight we're getting the presentation here and then we have another regular meeting in two weeks and then we may want to consider a special meeting on June 14th or 19th, um, depending on what the outcomes are this evening. And then July 28th would be the last regular meeting to adopt the resolution and the ordinance to put it on the November ballot. So we have tonight, um, and then we potentially could take action in two weeks, another opportunity. But that's, those are really sort of the last two windows to really put things in place to get ready for July 28th. This item was reviewed at the FAC earlier this week. Um, the FAC had, I think they, there was different opinions on the FAC, is my understanding, and we have FAC members here, so feel free to chime in if I get it incorrect. But my understanding is, is that overall, the recommendation was that direct staff to continue to work on a potential second home tax measure, uh, to direct the city attorney to begin work on the ordinance itself. Um, su they suggested forming a committee to look into the feasibility of whether there was community energy for a campaign to support something like this. Uh, they suggested potentially considering representatives outside of the city council. Um, and a couple of fact members did offer their uh, offer to participate. Um, I will note that there's not enough time at this stage for us to go out and widely advertise the committee. Uh, so if council wanted to form a committee, I think you could form an ad hoc committee and uh, staff could invite other key folks to attend those meetings as well. So here's my recommendation. Number one is, is to make the threshold decision if we should continue on this process or if we should um, stop at this time. And if we are gonna continue on this process, I might suggest an ad hoc committee of a couple of council members to evaluate community support, you know, see whether or not there's energy out there for a campaign. I think a campaign would, would be would really be necessary if we're going to have a chance of passing something like this. And also think about the connection of, between a campaign and the potential uses. Uh, and then the committee could potentially provide input uh, to staff as we draft the ordinance if there's some other key item that we didn't cover this evening that we need feedback on. Understanding that the full ordinance itself would obviously come back to the council for approval. So. That's the key. The first decision is number one up here, if we're going to continue working. And if we do, um, consider the committee, and then we'd be looking for feedback on kind of the, the bones of an ordinance, which is the threshold, staff suggested 60 to 90 days, the tax amount, 4,000 for single families, 2,000 for condos, the enforcement process I outlined, yet exemptions I outlined, 
and then I think I might suggest punting on the uses for the time being and let your ad hoc committee do some work on that. With that, I'm available for questions. Council Member Brooks. Yeah. Uh, Jamie, did you say Santa Cruz City's measure is going on in November? And it's and no, they've already decided where Santa Cruz City was at right now. So the initiative in Santa Cruz is actually being driven by um, a ballot initiative process. That is, the, the voters, not the city council, are looking to put this on the ballot. So they've collected signatures, they've submitted them to the, to the city, and they're now verifying the signatures. My understanding is, is that they submitted a lot of signatures, so the expectation is that it will qualify. Um, I guess I should also add there's a very interesting detail about if it's this tax is proposed by voters, voter signatures, it's a 50% measure. If it's proposed by the city council, it's 66. So it's, there's an interesting nuance there between what's happening in Santa Cruz and what we're talking about. 66 and two-thirds. Yes, those last two-thirds are important. You've got to get to the finish line, don't you? So. Thank you. Questions from council members? I'm sorry, Mayor Sir, I do. I do have one more. I wrote it down and I just saw it. Um, Jamie, you, you also mentioned the this, this subcommittee with the, the language that to, de to determine whether to put it on November. Um, I'm wondering if, if the fact or if staff thought about if the subcommittee were created looking at potentially punching it till further when we have a higher turnout of voters like a presidential during the presidential um, season and and so was there any conversation about that because 66 and two-thirds is a challenge or whatever that percent is you know during especially with the outcomes of this particular voting cycle which we had an extremely low turnout I will defer to either our finance director or one of the fact members for whether the fact talked about. I think that's certainly an option. You know, clearly in two years it's a presidential cycle. Um, and so I think that's clearly an option in front of council. Um, and the question is, is, would you want to make that decision now? Would you like to let the subcommittee maybe churn on it a bit? Um, but I, I don't know whether the fact talked about that or whether a two years out was a good idea. What about you, though? What was your what was your internal? You know, honestly, I, I thought when we saw the polling results, we weren't going to get anywhere. You know, I talked to a couple folks who um, may have had concerns about it, opposed the tax, and they did. Um, that's very important. The opposition to taxes makes them very hard to pass. I think. Again, to try to move the needle and get to 66%, it's gonna take a lot of work. And I think it would take a campaign. It would take somebody putting their hand up and saying, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna dedicate some time. I'll put together signs, I will organize some mailers. Um, otherwise, I think, I think it's probably better to wait two years. Do keep in mind that then in four years, Measure F will be coming up. So, um, that is something else to keep on your horizon. So in 2024, we have a presidential. 2026 is the last election before Measure F expires. Vice Mayor Kaiser, and I did. And if you want to address the question about the facts, yeah. yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, but correct me if I misspeak from the meeting. Um, we did go over. Um, either possibly pushing it back to two years or four years, but also that sort of the, the backing of that would be that we could essentially start legal legal work and things on on the movement and to get us in that right direction so that it, the work would be done and would still be there. Um, so taking that step in that direction, I think could be possible. Um, also, uh, Creating the ad hoc committee, I think, would be great. I, I loved what Gene did with his polling, but I, as I've kind of 
like thought about it this to myself is like, well, I, I wasn't pulled. I didn't hear about the polling, things like that. I feel like there's other ways that we can gain community outreach um, to better understand where people's points of view are um, along with the fact. Um, it, so it, in that polling that Jane did, um, in that when the percentages changed based on when it was stated that the tax money would either go to affordable housing and roads or something it the the percentage of yeses went down so i don't know if that's a result of joining those two points together or not focusing on one versus the other or what affordable housing rated really high obviously in concerns of our city so i don't know if there's a way to capitalize on that um like I'm going off on a tangent on that one question, but um, I think either way, this is something that we could start um, initializing on and getting the work done so that we are prepared. If we don't do it in November, um, I think it's still something that we need to like put some energy into. Personally. Also member Brown. Thank you. So this kind of goes to um, what Vice Mayor Kaiser was just saying. So my question is, essentially, we could decide tonight, yes, move forward with drafting an ordinance, a bare bones ordinance, move forward with putting together an ad hoc committee. And then even if that committee said, you know what, now is not the time to do it. We would still have an ordinance that we could just put in the filing cabinet and two years from now, we wouldn't have to start it all over. That work is done, correct? Is that right? I'll let Sam yes. chime in here. In theory, yes. Um, sure, in theory, but you know, in reality, my Santa Cruz is going to put this on the ballot. San Francisco, I assume Santa Cruz is going to put this on the ballot. I think San Francisco has one on the ballot. It's possible other cities will put this on the ballot. So it's possible that if we wanted to do this in two years, we would have other models than we have now. And right. some of the taxes that are out now may have been litigated in two years. So we could see what um, portions need to be tweaked. Mm -hmm. We might also have um, data from other cities about how they um, enforce the tax, um, how they deal with appeals. So some of the sort of logistics in the tax we could tweak whether or not that would be enough to change this. I, I, whether or not we would, it would need to be tweaked so much in two years that we would still be able to even use what we draft now. I don't know. It, it, it seems I, I, I can't, I can't say that, but it's not, you know, look, if you want to do this, it's not exorbitant for us to draft it. Jamie's right that it is, different and more expensive and more cumbersome for us to draft than a tax that's been on the ballot multiple times. But if, if, if you want to do this, I, I would encourage you to just move forward with it and not worry about whether or not the work product can be used two years from now. Okay, I guess that's, that's kind of my, part of my question though, right, is, is when Jamie suggested this isn't the kind of ordinance where we just change it from 10% to 12%, I guess what I'm saying is if we, if we are going to put in the resources to pay for this ordinance to be drafted, right? Yeah, are we gonna have to start all over in two years if we decide to do this? Or in two years, will it essentially become the difference of, oh, we found some new stuff, so let's change it from 10% to 12%, or let's change this 4K to 5K, or let's change, you know, whatever it may be. Um, really, oh, sorry. No, 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 I think I, I, didn't I wrapped it up. It was, I'm, I was good enough with what I said. <laughs> Go ahead. It really depends on what happens in the next two years. It depends, you know, the Oakland tax has not been subject to a challenge on the on constitutionality. Could be that another tax is. And so the courts say, you know, this is totally illegal. That, I, I think that's unlikely. But could be that the courts say this provision of the tax is unlawful. So you have to completely take that out. Could be that another city comes up with a brilliant and super easy way to enforce the tax and so we decide to put that in. I, I don't know that anyone, we just can't really say, but I, I, 
I do think that the investment that you're making is, you should not assume that you're preparing a task that will necessarily be able to be used in two years. If, if you want to make the investment, you should just make it now. Okay. Yeah, sounds like it. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to take this opportunity to maybe go after this um, and see if any member of the public um, wants to speak on this item. If there is, um, just raise your hand in the Zoom application. You can dial star nine. You'll be given three minutes to speak. Um, or you may um, write an email. Send it to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, I'm not seeing any hands, Larry. Um, are there any emails? Larry, sir, we have not received any emails on this item, and no one, no attendees have their hands raised. Okay, I'll bring it back to see the will of the council. Um, council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I just had a few comments. I, you know, I appreciate staff bringing this up because there is a lot of opportunity here. I think that hearing the report and, and just hearing some uh, what some of the community's feedback was on it on it, you know, that there's 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 opportunity here. And um, but I think that there's also an opportunity here to to somewhat rewrite the narrative. I think that the way that this this item was pulled um, and that the way that it was represented in the papers and things like that was not really ultimately what the intent um, of the ballot measure that we're discussing to, uh, today was, was meant for. And so I like the idea of creating a subcommittee to explore that and to rewrite this narrative, to um, have these conversations, to possibly look at potential new polling with um, a, different in a, a difference in approach. Um, we're calling it a second home tax. Um, and, and I think that caused a lot of confusion. I, I was toying with the idea of like, well, is it an, an unoccupied tax or a vacancy tax? Um, but the fact that we're, we're equally new to this um, as similar to, to Oakland and we're still waiting on the outcomes of Santa, the city of Santa Cruz, um, that I, I'm comfortable with moving on to forming a subcommittee and having these conversations and seeing if there were someone in the community to, to really take this on. Um, but I'm still left with confusion on whether to spend the dollars right now today with with our city attorney in drafting something. And so, Samantha, I wasn't quite clear in your response whether it, doing it now or doing the, it later is the same. I, I think I got halfway through understanding that, you know, it could look very different in two years. Um, and so is it worth the time to start that now and spending the $15,000 now versus in two years or just waiting for the subcommittee? So I still have that question and I, and I maybe you have a better, I, I think you were saying now is fine, but you're also saying later is fine too. <laughs> I think that was yeah, your answer. I, I think in my mind I was answering a different question. So perhaps I, under, I misunderstood Council Member Brown's question. If, if you want to put a tax on, if you are considering, if the council is considering at all putting a tax on the November 2022 ballot, we should just wrap mm. it tomorrow. Now, right. But if, exactly. if the subcommittee punts it, or want to do it in 2024, there's no sense in starting that that process. That's right. But I think that given the timing, I mean, Oakland pulled and worked on this tax for a year before they put it on the ballot. Yeah. So yeah. given the timing and where we are now, I think the subcommittee in my office are going to have to work simultaneously. Right. Um, if it were to go on the November ballot, and I'm not sure that I'm comfortable. Well, I will say that I'm not comfortable with it going on the November ballot. I don't think we're ready for that. I think that the city, because there's so much great opportunity here for us to really be successful in this, that there it actually could happen, that we have a little bit more work to do rather than just putting on the November ballot, knowing that there's, um, with the low uh, turnouts and 
um, that you know, we have a presidential election coming up in 2024, which generally increases the voter turnout. There's just a lot of those things um, uh, of getting the community engaged in a good way. Um, so I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not comfortable sitting on the November ballot. I'm fine with the subcommittee starting the process um, and having these conversations. Those are just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bertrand. And I think all of us have run campaigns and we're pretty familiar with the fact that it takes a lot of preparation, uh, not only in terms of raising money, but in terms of getting that support out there, the initial support that you'll you'll need to start on, you know, many months ahead of time, so you build some momentum. And that's my main concern about putting it on for November. Um, the second concern, and I think it came out through our discussion here tonight when we reflected on the polling data, is this is a relatively new issue for people and the understanding about what it means and what it doesn't mean is, is something terribly new. Um, so we could be real aggressive and put something on in a sense I do. Sam, uh, excuse me, I'm following your suggestion. If we want to be aggressive and do it in November, we got to start working on the ordinance right now. So totally agree with that. Um, but then is the committee and then is the issue of making sure that we're going to be successful. And if we do it, it's 66 and two thirds. So I think that's a hard thing to lift. Um, I'm going in Yvette's uh, direction that, you know, let's, let's do a committee and work it out in our, commu in our community. I think um, one thing that um, Jamie has identified that's really critical is what are we going to use the money for? And identifying those issues that really resonate with our residents, it's what is going to make it a successful campaign because people say, yeah, I could, I could, once I understand what this tax is, I can easily see spending it on those particular projects. And historically, that's been the success of our campaigns in Capitola. Talked about the war. You know, we talked about a lot of different things, uh, money for kids, stuff like that. And that's what made our campaign successful. So I'm going with Yvette. And I think many others may be thinking the same way, is doing a committee and start hashing it out, making sure that we have some good solid groundwork before we move forward and give us enough time for the next ballot measure, not this one coming up in December, so we can be successful. Uh, those are my comments. You're on mute mayor story, but I'm pretty sure that I can, I'm pretty sure I see no, I, I, I was calling on you. Are we still in questions or are we on to comments? Because I can't remember. Have we gone out to public comment on this yet? Yes, we have. Yeah, okay. Sorry. We're, we're in the liberty of faith. It's been a long night. Okay, just confirming. Um, well, regardless, I have a question. Um, if we do wait for another two years to put this on the ballot, are our polling numbers going to matter anymore at this point? At that point, are we going to need to re poll in 2024 and spend the same money that we already spent on the polling this year? Um, I mean, you never have to poll. There's no requirement. I always will recommend it because, you know, it certainly helps inform the process. But I think especially with what will happen with Santa Cruz, where I suspect there's going to be a lot of discussion around this, um, that we would want to pull it again. How much, can you remind me what was our, what we spent on, or what did we budget for the polling? I think it was 18000 Wow. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm, I feel like we're in a really tough spot because I understand and agree that not rushing through this is, is prudent. Waiting to see how this turns out in other cities and letting them kind of be the guinea pigs is a smart idea. And then at the same, at the same time, we've already spent nearly twenty thousand dollars on polling. Um, we would spend another twenty thousand on polling in two years if this doesn't. You know, it's really odd because if this doesn't work out. We spent, you know, what maybe a total of forty between polling and ballot measures and drafting the ordinance, um, and that forty is down the drain. We can't try to do this again in two years. It's not going to work. But if it works out, 
we're going to get 850000 to $2.1 million a year from here on out. And that's huge for us. Um, so we've got a pretty significant list of both pros and cons. And the, the kind of most difficult part about it is it sounds like we don't really have time, even the two-week period, for a, a subcommittee to... Well, actually, maybe that is the, maybe that is the, the answer, right? Is maybe we do start drafting the ordinance, have the subcommittee move forward and considering if this is the right time and getting, giving more consideration to these pros and cons. And then at our next me meeting in two weeks, we make that final decision. Because I feel like right now we have a lot of things to weigh that we're trying to do in this one meeting. And I'm not even sure that I know where I land right now. I have concerns about doing it this year. I have concerns about waiting for two more years. But there's not a lot to be lost in just saying, let's spend two weeks talking about it. Let's let our attorneys draft an ordinance in those two weeks. And next meeting, we will have had that time to consider if this is the right thing for us to do right now. I don't know if those comments really move this conversation forward at all, or if I just like thought out loud for the last three minutes, but those are my comments. Your thoughts always move us forward. Um, Vice Mayor Kazi? Thank you. Yeah, I want to respond to that. Um, I, it, I personally am pretty strongly with moving forward with this. Um, while it may seem rushed, um, I do, I, I'm sort of that person that's like, Right, well, the iron pot. I feel like it is a it is a subject right now that is happening around us in other counties. I do feel like if it is tacked on to a presidential vote, that it's going to be watered down and not focused on as much as it would be in the upcoming November election. If it is something, um, I could for sure get an ad hoc committee together within the next two weeks for our next meeting. Um, if anybody wants to decide how you would like that to be made up of. Um, I would be on that committee along with um, Alexander Peterson and then um, Julia, I'm forgetting her last name, from the SAC committee. Um, Laura, Laura Alioto. Laura, not Julia. Oh my God, sorry. Sorry, Laura. And, um, and then add on whoever else we might need if we need another council member or Jim or whoever needs <laughs> You're welcome, Jim, uh, to be on that committee. Um, I am ready to get the ball rolling. So to make us feel slightly more comfortable, I'm not saying that I feel 100% comfortable, but um, I think if it's something we want to get working on, we could totally do it. And I personally, um, I spoke to Jamie about this. I would like to get a city poll going on our own that we as council members, if we're interested in reaching out to our personal um, community members and pulling them ourselves and getting um, just a different method of outreach. I think that's a way to go about this, that we could probably receive information from the public in a pretty sweet, quick manner. Um, but uh, so I, I mean, I'd like to make a motion to move forward uh, with uh, I might need some help here. Um, if, if, if I could jump in on yeah. the ad hoc committee, yeah. Um, maybe we want it, the council would like to flesh that out a little bit. Yeah, the that's only, fine. Yeah, the only people who can be on an ad hoc committee um, are two council members, no one else, no members of the community, no members of staff. Um, any other committee would be governed by the Brown Act which would mean any other committee formed on the dais would be governed by the Brown Act, which means you'd have to agendize and notice meetings, which might slow you down. Oh. So council members, you go. If you could form an ad hoc committee of two council members who are interested in, like, getting right out of the beginning, um, finding out whether there's support, um, giving guidance on the ordinance, um, and then you could certainly talk to people in your network and bring that information to the ad hoc committee meetings. And certainly you could ask Jamie or the finance director to join you at those meetings, but they would not be officially on the committee. So that's one thing. Um, Thank you. The other thing, I don't remember what the motion would be, but I'm happy to help you if you need help on that 
Sam, just to clarify, you you were saying that the fact members could be invited to join. No, they couldn't, they couldn't join the committee. The only but they could be there. Certainly, come to a meeting. They just as spectators, and they can give their opinion at the committee. They just could not be on the committee. The only ad hoc committee that is council for on the dais is comprised solely of two council members. But, and, and then otherwise, um, it would have to be a notice um, committee meeting. That's right. Jimmy, would there be any problems with, with doing that? Having a notice meeting? No. I mean, we can just, the downside of doing that is, of course, you know, you may want to have, um, it's really up to the council. The council has the discretion if you'd like. We can do it as staff. We notice Brown Act meetings all the time. I think this question for the council just is, is that okay? And the meetings to the public, or would you prefer to have, you know, an opportunity for, um, an opportunity for different kinds of discussion? Right, and another issue with the Brown Act committee meeting would be just like the council, a quorum would need to be present for the committee to meet, and more than a quorum could not discuss the issue off of outside of the notice mm -hmm. meeting. Thank you, uh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Vice Mayor, I, I understand where you're going with this, and I, I love the the forward thinking and trying to engage the community. Um, I think it's twofold here though, um, similar to what Jamie was talking about, is that there could be an initiative created by our constituents and that kind of recommendation could be made by this subcommittee, this ad hoc committee that forms probably by, well, you want to be on it clearly and whatever other council member um, and that could be a recommendation from this ad hoc committee of council members. And so if you wanted to continue that, I think that would make sense to have those conversations um, to again, engage the community to ensure that you get um, the right amount of votes. And should, like, like Jamie said, if it's a community run, if it's a, it's, if it's the constituents running it and putting it on the ballot and getting all the signatures by November and, and really doing that, that's only a 50% vote and it is more likely. So, you know, but that recommendation could most certainly come out of this subcommittee. And so I'm, you know, I, I'm hesitant to spend the $10,000 on, on our city attorney to draft something because if it is a city, if it's a city initiative, that's one thing, but if it's a community, initiative passing by 50%, that's a different thing. And so I'm not opposed to getting our attorney on it right away, but I'm thinking hearing from you that there's been some interest that it could go in a different direction. And if that's the case, we would be drafting, the, the constituents would be drafting language in a different way. And so um, just food for thought. And so may, my, my recommendation would be that we would just form an ad hoc committee here with the two council members, have those con conversations offline, seeing which direction we could go in. Um, and then we have a meeting coming up, Jamie, right, where at any point we can activate our city attorney to, if it's not going to go to a community vote or a community ballot measure and it stays within here, then we can activate Samantha as soon as possible. The one point of clarification is I don't believe at this stage a uh, citizen's petition has enough time to qualify for the ballot. And that uh, wasn't my point necessarily. Yeah, it would, okay, I just heard you mention community members' and names wanting to be on it, and, and that most certainly helps us. That's just another part of a conversation that a subcommittee could have, right? Like if we have enough people in the community and we get a 50%, in the next cycle, maybe not 2024 or whatever, or, you know, there's other opportunities there is all I'm saying. So, I'm sorry, did I misspeak? So it, I should have said subcommittee instead of ad hoc? Is, or are those two different things or not? Or is that the same thing? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what- Same thing, okay. 
Um, sorry. <laughs> no, I was I was only going off of that based on um, the fact that there was interest from people on the fact, and not saying that they necessarily would be the ones doing the work and getting the signatures, but that um, there's people willing to help out in sort of a campaign direction, but that it would still be put forth by the city. Um, well, I. I think Vice Mayor Franklin, you had started out trying to make a motion or to provide direction uh, in this matter. Yes. Um, you want to take another stab at it? Sure, yeah. I will definitely do that. Um, let me make sure I'm on the right one. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would um, like to make a motion um, to provide policy input regarding the structure for a second home tax on the November ballot um, and per, uh, prepare documentation necessary to place the item on the ballot. Um, and that's my motion. Yeah. All right. Get more information on that. Are you directing, are, are you um, moving, are you suggesting that the council form a subcommittee, and if and also, are you in? Is your does your motion direct staff to start preparing documentation to put the item on the ballot? Yes, please. Okay, thanks. So I think. Yeah, you're my, right. you, Sorry, yes, Mayor. Sam, yeah, my interpretation was that she was moving the first option under the recommended action. Yeah, thank you. In the staff report. So, um, and with that, I'll, I'll see if there's a second. Um, is there a second to the motion before we move on? I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the, the first option. Sorry, I'm, I'm going through the packet. I thought there was just like a couple different bullet points. I didn't know there were. Yeah, just... Hold on, sorry. I, I, I want to. Under, I understand what I'm supporting. Yeah, under the recommended actions um, in the staff report, the first option. Oh, I see. I see. Either yeah. provide policy input with our instruction. Can staff pull that up so I can see it? I can. Give me a second. I see. So, can I ask for clarification on the motion? Margo, are you suggesting that they move forward with putting it on the ballot or just that we write the ordinance and then decide later if it will go to the ballot? I'm saying put it on the ballot. Yeah, yeah. I'm still You're when, ready to move forward. When it yeah. refers to November, that's November of 2022. Correct? For clarification purposes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's the motion. Is there a second? Going, going, gone. The motion fails for the lack of a second. Um, is there another motion? Council Member Brown, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I think so. All yeah. right. So, okay. I, I, I would like to make a motion in the spirit of the motion that Vice Mayor Kaiser just made to essentially direct our city attorney move forward in drafting an ordinance um, regarding a vacant home tax with a $4,000 slash $2,000 um, tax for the single family home versus condominium with a 90 day threshold. If your house is, is empty for a whole quarter, a whole quarter of a year, it's, it's you know, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, 4,000, 2,000, 90 day threshold uh, with the exemptions listed here on the screen. Um, and in the meantime, develop an ad hoc committee of two council members to be determined to spend the next two weeks considering the feasibility of putting this on the November 2022 ballot its potential community outreach plan and recommended uses 
for the test. That's my motion. And then as kind of a an aside, that then next meeting we could determine based on our own private reflections and the discussions of that ad hoc committee whether we are actually ready to put that ordinance on the ballot in 2022 or if we are going to take what was created for us and put it on the shelves until 2024. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Are there um, any clarifying questions from council members? Um, I think so just to add before, you know, uh, that motion um, in, um, implies that there will be um, two council members volunteering uh, to be on the committee. Um, Vice Mayor Kaiser has, has volunteered. I assume that still stands. Um, is there another council member that would be interested in just participating? I think all the rest of us were hoping the same thing, but I, I think all right. it's important to um, kind of get that cleared up before we pass them. We need an ad hoc committee? I mean, if we don't need one, scratch that and we can just, I can grassroots it and just manifest some stuff. <laughs> well, to, to that point, actually, I mean, but really, any two of us having a discussion is now an ad hoc committee. So, you raised point. a good point. <laughs> you do not need, and, and as said Vice Mayor Kaiser, you do not need an ad hoc committee. Um, any two members can talk to each other at any time, so long as you don't talk to another member. And any two members or any one member can talk to your communities at any time. So, no, you don't need an ad hoc committee. And if when I'm drafting the ordinance, um, I need assistance from one or two um, council members, I know how to find you. And I think I've already shared the challenges I think we'll face. And, and, and those are just the challenges I think that we would be facing, not that I'm opposed to wanting this passed, right? And right. so, I mean, that's just food for thought. So if you want to brown ask yourself with me, Vice Mayor, I would be more than happy to have that conversation with you to bring to move this forward. That sounded like a volunteer. <laughs> I hear I hear a second volunteer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll call for the vote on the motion. Okay. And is every, everyone clear on the motion, or would you like me to rephrase it? I'll I'll be on the mayor. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I, I think we're all clear. Okay, um, fabulous. From the motion. Thank you. Are we gonna do that committee formally or not formally? So then you need to amend your motion. I will amend my motion to say that we are not forming an ad hoc committee. We are just going to discuss amongst ourselves in accordance with Brown Act rules. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, so Council Member Bertrand. Yeah, that, well, before we proceed, I just wanted to clarify, um, does that still mean that um, that the staff committee volunteers uh, and not participate? Or no, I think in that case, any of us can talk to anyone on the staff at any point, right? right. Yeah. yeah, so they could um, participate. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that point. All right, let's go ahead with the roll call vote. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, a very tricky item, um, I know. So. Um, Let's move on. Um, since it's getting late, we'll move on to the final item, 8C, which is the established timeline for returning to in-person city council meetings. Um, the recommended action is to establish a date for city council 
along with the Planning Commission and all its advisory bodies to hold in-person meetings with remote attendance options for members of the public. Um, and also, I mean, just, I mean, I'll inform the council that the Arts Commission has already started uh, meeting uh, in person. Um, so some, some of our advisory bodies have already initiated that process. But, um, there's staff, oh, Chloe, are you going to? Yes, thank you, Larry. I'll try to go uh, quickly, but first I just want to double check. Moderator Larry, is everyone seeing the correct screen? It, it looks correct. Thank you. Okay, so yes, as the mayor uh, mentioned, this is a quick item to discuss uh, in-person council meetings. Um, a little background, as you know, we're functioning kind of based upon AB 361. That's the uh, long speech that I give at the beginning of every meeting. Um, that allows these types of virtual meetings that suspend part of the Brown Act or amend part of the Brown Act. And there are some requirements to adopt findings every 30 days, which you did during consent this evening. And um, it does require a declared state of emergency from the governor. So on March 24th, staff presented different options on potentially having in-person meetings continue. And at that time, council gave direction to um, move forward with getting the equipment necessary to allow for professional hybrid meetings so that members of the public can continue to use Zoom to attend meetings while um, council will be returning in person at chambers. So the priority was for virtual attendance for the public and also there was a recommendation to look at other agency policies for that type of a meeting. And I can tell you that the equipment was researched and ordered. There were um, several delays, you know, out of our control due to being able to get the equipment. But our fingers are crossed that everything should be installed by the end of June. I believe we do have everything and there is um, installation scheduled for this month. So that's very exciting and a huge thanks to uh, Larry for handling that. And that will allow virtual attendance with an in-person meeting at a professional level, continuing to stream on YouTube, et cetera. Um, council will be in person. Virtual attendance, if necessary, you know, an illness or out of town, would still be possible if we keep up AB 361's um, requirements. And a suggestion is that staff or other outside collaborators or you know, presenters from a different jurisdiction could potentially be in person or virtual depending on the city manager's discretion. So our recommendation this evening is fairly simple to establish a date for city council to return to in-person meetings. There will be the hybrid option for the public. And because uh, we're not exactly sure when it will be installed, we're hoping for by the end of June, the next meeting after that would be July 28th followed by August 25th or September 8th. So those are kind of the next three meetings after the, the hoped date of installation. And as a reminder, we can certainly schedule practice sessions using the new technology before we go live. So if you have questions, please let me know. Otherwise, there's your recommendation on the screen. Thank you. Great question. Seeing none. Um, are there any members of the public that would like to address the council on this matter? Um, if so, raise your hand in Zoom or dial star nine or dial or submit an email to public comments at ca.capitola.ca.us. Um, Larry, you seeing anyone? Um, Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees with their hands raised to speak on this item, and we have not received any emails. Okay, I'll bring it back to the council. Um, somebody have a proposed date? Councilmember Brown. Yes, thank you. Um, as you see here, we only have one meeting in July. We have one meeting in August. I'm thinking in the summertime, uh, July specifically, there's going to be a lot of people in our community and potentially on our council that are on vacation and whatnot. So maybe that would not be the best time for us to return. But I think the other benefit of, of us returning uh, 
on the August meeting is again because there's only one meeting in August it gives us a little bit more time to work out any bugs that we may find are in the system when we get the new equipment in um, and so I would like to make a motion that we return to in-person hybrid meetings on August 25th. Oh, okay. I'll oh, second. A second to that motion. And shot to second. Did our city manager have a, or I'm sorry, our city attorney have a comment? Thank you, Councilman Brown. I just want to let you know um, that I, I feel like I could not mention that since you're discussing it, this since you're discussing the item. Um, there is legislation pending regarding this issue. Um, 8361, as you know, is in place until um, January of 2024. Uh, there's legislation pending that would overlap. We, it, it's uh, still being rewritten because it's still making its way through the state Senate. It, it, would over, it looks like it would overlap 8361 and would allow hybrid meetings until 2024 for any reason, regardless of whether there's an emergency declaration in place. And then there are different phases. And it looks like long term, the plan is to allow hybrid meetings, um, regardless of whether there is an emergency declaration in place. That's nice. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any other uh, deliberation? Um, I mean, I'll just say um, I'd prefer to come back in July. Um, I mean, that gives us really a kind of a dress rehearsal before we get into our regular scheduled set of meetings, which would start on August 25th. Just my thoughts. I'm, I, I'm not going to oppose the motion, though. So, um, let's have a roll call vote. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, and that brings us to item adjournment. Um, before um, we sign up, though, um, it was pointed out to me that I had been remiss and did not ask for a roll call at the start of the meeting. Um, so, but Chloe, do you have everything you need um, to make this meeting official so we don't have to do it over again? You know, I think we're going to have to start over, Mayor Story. <laughs> All right, if that's what you're willing. Let's... Thank you for checking. Goodbye. I, I think we're fine. <laughs> uh oh, we're starting to lose them already. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to make sure Thank that we're you. in good shape. Um, with that and you have everything that you need uh, from us um, and I'll just say thank you everyone um, I, I think a lot of significant and good discussion this evening um, and I will adjourn this meeting until our next regularly scheduled meeting uh, of the Capitol City Council on June 23rd uh, 2022 um, and uh, as I always say be kind to yourself and be kind to others good night everyone mm -hmm.